tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Have you come to relieve your burden unto the Lord? Asked the elder priest from behind the blind of the confession booth. Silence hung to answer the offer. Rather than immediately persist, the elder priest decided to let him take his time. For in the last seventeen and a half years he'd been an elder priest of Black Rock Chapel, he had learned that they would feel the compulsion of conscience to confess their unrighteous deeds in the Lord's due time. The youth was shaking. His hands were firmly clasped around his upper arms, leading to his shoulders shivering. The youth was hunching over, rocking back and forth in the wooden chair within the confession booth. His left eye twitched as his face remained chiseled in a state of petrified terror. There's no need to fear, my son, whispered the elder priest, hearing the distress on the adolescent's side of the booth. Christ bids forgiveness to all who trespass against him. All he asks is for repentance of your sins and to seek reform from him. The creaking of the youth's wooden chair began to die down as yet his breathing began to quiver in place of his body. Forgiveness, the boy whimpered softly, his voice continuing to tremble in a traumatized manner. No, no forgiveness. Hearing the youth's remark, the elder priest repeated his assurance of the Lord's mercy to the boy. No salvation, no savior. I've made their bid, father. I made their bid, and I am debased. Though unnerved by the youth's pessimism, the elder priest remained composed. Come now, my son. God has promised salvation to all who walk astray. All you must do is confess and repent your sins. Worry not of the judgment of others, for the confidence of a priest is sacred. The youth offered a dry laugh in response before retorting, I care nothing for the judgment of others, for they too are as devoid of any hope of salvation as I. The voice of the adolescent began to deepen to the pitch of a man twice his age and began to take on an air of malign satisfaction at the statement's insinuation. Confused, the elder priest wanted to question the youth as to the meaning of his statement. More than anything, however, the elder priest was perplexed about the boy's purpose for attending the confessional as a whole. Do you not, young man, accept the Lord into your heart? Are you not one of his children? The elder priest queried unsure about the state of the youth's soul. No, no, father, I no longer succumb to the church's lies, for I have seen otherwise. The youth's voice shook again, the tone growing even deeper and angrier in timbre. My eyes were open to the truth long ago. They showed me the truth. They, the elder priest questioned, curious as to exactly to whom the implication belonged. Yes, they, the true harbingers of the truth. You see, father, through them you may see the truth, their prophecy. The elder priest became truly disturbed at hearing such blatantly sacrilegious claims. Remaining calm, he told the blaspheming young man that there existed no truth outside the Lord. The young man let out a defiant and condescending laugh. <laughs> then you are a blind old fool. Despite the offer of being shown the truth, you would choose to hold on to the lies of the so-called Holy Gospel. Realizing that the youth had no intention of repentance, 
The elder priests felt compelled to end the confessional. A light rapping on the outside of the booth found this silent request granted. Just before departing, the youth turned toward the elder priest one more time and, with an abysmally baritone voice, said, You'll see the truth, father. I will show you their prophecy that there is no salvation. Another short succession of knocks prompted the youth to finally leave the confession booth, allowing the patron outside, an older maiden of forty-five years, to enter. Have you come to relieve your burden unto the Lord? The elder priest asked the maiden, still feeling rattled. I, I have come to confess, father. You see... The maiden began her confession, but the elder priest's mind had become far too entwined in the young man's morbid diatribe to lend her his attention. Oh, how can I be forgiven, father? The maiden beckoned, arousing the elder priest from his anxious pondering to find her in tears at having concluded her confession. Though he had not heard her sins, he decided against attempting to ask her to repeat herself. Instead, he merely assured her that she was forgiven in the eyes of the Lord, and requested no less than five Hail Marys before the day's end. Upon concluding the maiden's confessional, the elder priest retired to his bedchamber to attempt letting peaceful rest cleanse away anxiety. Slumber would be an uphill conflict for him that night. However, no matter his efforts, the elder priest's mind continued to be ravaged by the youth's words. You will see the truth. There is no salvation. When the sun rose the next morning, the elder priest felt weak. His head throbbed horribly, and he felt trifle knots in his stomach. The elder priest winced in pain as he attempted to open his eyes, massaging his temples in a feeble attempt to ease the migraine's hold on him. Father Carraway! The elder priest broke from his stupor at the calling of his name. Father Carraway, is everything all right? Asked another of the chapel's elders, a balding man with only stubble for facial hair who stood a good two feet shorter than Father Carraway, despite being five years his elder. Yes distantly answered the bedridden elder priest, as if his response was voiced before his mind could comprehend his train of thought. Despite the persistence of his current ailments, regaining his proper composure offered the most welcoming smile on his face he could manage before elaborating, Father Edwards, I didn't hear you come in. Yes, everything is fine. I just feel a tad ill this morning. I trust it's nothing serious. Father Carraway attempted to offer a chuckle of ease to the fellow priest that devolved into a painful cough, prompting him to use the sleeve of his bedrobe to cover his mouth. For a moment, his eyes widened in shock at the sight of a small black stain on the sleeve of his snow-white bedrobe. Father? queried Father Edwards, noting the momentary state of anxious apprehension on the face of his peer. Yes, replied Father Carraway, seeing the skepticism on his visitor's face. I told you it's nothing serious, a minor ailment that I'm sure will pass by morning. Now, what brings you to my bedchamber, Father? I and the others heard you last night. You kept screaming, no salvation, and we heard thrashing sounds coming from down the chamber halls, replied Father Edwards his voice composed of concern for the well-being of his fellow priest. No salvation? The words slowly infested his mind, causing a sharp chill to crawl down his spine. Ignorant of the fellow elder priest's claim, Father Carraway reassured his visitor that, save for his current ailments, he was perfectly sound. His thoughts, however, began struggling once again to void themselves of the memories of the previous night's haunting confessional. 
Skeptical, but overall satisfied with the elder priest's condition, Father Edwards bade his farewell and exited the bedchamber. Father Carraway laid in his bed all through the morning and into the afternoon. The aches and pains worsened. A shrill scream finally roused the ailing Father Carraway from his bed. Though physically ill, the elder priest found himself able to bound out of his bed and sprint up the spiral stone stairs to the bell tower of Black Rock Chapel with the speed and agility of a man much younger than he. When he reached the top of the stone stairs, he found a young maiden, one of the chapel's fledgling nuns who had not yet sworn her oath of purity, doubled over, wailing into her palms. What is it, dear sister? Father Carraway gently but firmly grasped the young maiden's shoulders. She, she, she... She stammered, utterly unable to voice a coherent reply. Who, child? What happened? But the young nun-to-be could only shake her head and continue wailing in response. Unable to voice a coherent response from the young sister, Father Carraway resolved to open the door behind her and enter the bell tower of the chapel and investigate the malignance himself. No! You mustn't go in there! The young sister shrieked, causing the elder priest's heart to skip a beat in his chest. Unclean! Unclean! She said as she buried her face into her palms again. Calm down, sister. I'll see what's going on. I want you to stay here. The young sister just sat, quivering, burying her petrified face into her palms. Father Carraway's hand trembled as he grasped the knob. Unclean, he wondered as he willed himself to open the door. The foul odor of death assaulted his senses immediately upon the door's opening. The elder priest turned his face into the crook of his arm and began to cough, gagged by the offensive scent. With an alarming dread mounting within him as to what lied inside the bell tower, Father Carraway instructed the budding nun to summon help. She bowed her head to him and immediately sprinted down the stone stairs to the monastery to alert the other elders of Black Rock Chapel. The inside of the bell tower was dark, only illuminated by a single torch mounted to each of the four stone brick walls, respectively. Paltry though the light was, the faint glow of the torches still revealed the unholy display within its claustrophobic confines. Adjusting his eyesight to the faint glow of the inside of the bell tower, he saw the corpse of one of the maidens of the village. It was an Irish maiden of forty-five, whom the father recognized as the tender of the nearby tavern, who had attended many confessions for her sins of lust. She was stripped bare and hanging from the tower's rafters by her neck, using the long, thick hemp to sound the sermon bell. A single word in her native tongue was carved on her breasts. Frau Schoon. The elder priest retched in disgust and horror at the abyssal display before him. With haste, he escaped the confines of the bell tower and slammed the door behind himself. Our father... Father Carraway began with a shuddering breath, crossing himself as he spoke. Hallowed be thy name. Our kingdom comes. Thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Father Carraway! The sound of his name broke him out of his petrified stupor. It was Father Edwards. Father Carraway, are you all right? Father Carraway had no words for his fellow priest, merely offering his current mortified stare as a response. Father Carraway, what in God's name happened? The urgency in Father Edward's voice was accentuated. She, she confessed to me. 
Tears began to streak Father Carraway's face as he pointed to the door that led into the peak of the bell tower. Determined to spy on the source of the hysteria, Father Edwards moved past the scarred Father Carraway and opened the door. Christ above! Sister Meredith, alert the authorities at once! The fledgling nun stood frozen with her jaw agape. Do as I say, sister! Make haste! barked Father Edwards. This snapped young Sister Meredith from her terrified trance, and she ran down the stone steps, bolting through the chamber halls and exiting through the sanctuary. We must alert Archbishop Marcus of this atrocity, Father Carraway beckoned. Father Edwards disagreed with the conclusion, thinking it wiser to handle the situation themselves. Are you mad, man? This is an attack against the church. Father Carraway's heart pounded in his chest with startling intensity, prompting him to clutch the left of his chest to slow the quakes of his heart. Easy now, Father. There's no need to make a larger problem of this than what is absolutely necessary to warrant. Confused and shocked by his fellow priest's hesitation at consulting the head of Black Rock Chapel, Father Carraway decided to press further for an explanation. Please trust me, old friend. If we are to become bishops ourselves, we must prove that we can handle situations like this ourselves. There's no use in disturbing Archbishop Marcus when in all likelihood this is nothing more than the act of a disturbed-minded individual who found convenience in the concealment of her body in the peak of the chapel's bell tower. A simple crime of passion, grotesque but simple nonetheless. Father Carraway nearly saw red. How can you say such things with such lax conviction? You, a priest, a servant of Christ! You expect me to just sit here while a credible threat to God's kingdom is swept idly under the rug? Before his tirade could escalate further, the elder priest felt something move across his feet. Perplexion overtaking his former frustration, he looked down to see a mass of inky black serpents surrounding his feet. Terror flooded through his entire body as he saw the serpents converge on him from all directions. Father Carraway, are you all right? asked Father Edwards. The elder priest only offered a weak gasp of horror in response as he saw the multitude of serpents spawning from the doorway leading into the bell tower. Father Carraway, what is it? Father Carraway stuttered, unable to fully comprehend the events unfolding before him. S -s 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 serpents Serpents? Father Edwards questioned eyeing the mortified priest with confusion. Can you not see them? They're everywhere! He stopped abruptly when he felt one of the serpents sink its fangs into his legs. The hallway within Black Rock Chapel's peak began to spin, dizzying the father. No sooner than his eyes could widen in shock that the serpent's supernaturally potent venom began to cripple the elder priest's senses. Father Carraway clutched his forehead with his left hand, as if doing so might in some fashion stabilize the dizziness, his right hand desperately grasping the crucifix pendant that hung from his neck. His eyelids began to feel heavy as vertigo began to transform into exhaustion. Father Carraway could see all too clearly before darkness would overtake him, despite the venom's assault on his senses. Father Edwards extended his hand as the black serpents then began to slither to him, appearing to answer some malign summons. The elder priest stumbled back in chilled fright as he witnessed them slither and seemingly begin to fuse into Father Edwards' body, as if the supposed fellow priest himself were composed of the demoniac serpents. 
The wriggling mass then appeared to revert back into the form of the priest as Father Carraway's legs began to lose the strength necessary for proper balance. His heart quaked in his fragile chest as with the meager composure he could manage in his damning plight, he staggered backward whilst the knuckles began to whiten on the hand that grasped the crucifix pendant. Our Father, thou art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. His labored, breathless words were abruptly silenced as his feet had misstepped, sending him crashing down the stone steps. Unconsciousness finally met the elder priest when his head struck the wall midway down the spiral. Two. Father Carraway wandered about in the ever-extended void of the subconscious. Unable to feel anymore, he wondered if he indeed perished through either the means of the serpent's venom or a crash down the spiraling stone stairs. Am I dead? Father Carraway pondered as he surveyed the void. Is this the entry to the kingdom of heaven? Nay, a monotone voice called to him, answering the father's internal query. Caught by surprise, he spun around to face the speaker. To his horror, the priest stood face to face with the ginger-haired Irish barmaiden he had seen hanging by the neck in the bell tower. She stood before him in the dark subconscious plane, completely bare, her milky white skin and grassy green-hued irises projecting the visage of life. The entrance to heaven is closed to us as it always was. Father Carraway closed his eyes, trying vainly to assure himself that this wasn't real. This is real, Father. Unlike the horseshit you spouted about God's forgiveness. Father Carraway struggled to attempt rebuttal to the specter's abrasive claim as utter dread clouded his abilities of reason. If that were true, Father, why not repent yourself for your continued heresies? G God forgives all who repent. The phantom let out a scoffing laugh that echoed throughout the void. The father felt compelled to cover his ears as the chuckling devolved into what he could only perceive as a cacophony of tortured wails emanating from all directions in the encroaching purgatory. The elder priest found himself, amidst his immediate sense of shock and dread in the ghoulish ethereal plane he found himself within, confused at the ghost's insinuation. What are you talking about? What falsehood have I spoken? As soon as the defiant query left Father Carraway's lips, his blood chilled as two serpents began to form in the dark void. His jaw went helplessly slack as the serpents, one whose scales were as dark as the nightmare plane it birthed from, the other whose scales were the hue of burning embers reminiscent of the depths of Tartarus, slithered their way to the maiden's feet. The phantom spoke again as the malign creatures coiled themselves to her legs. Her vocals took on a tormented, ethereal echo. If God's forgiveness is divine, how are we so many condemned? Father Carraway's tongue froze before any rebuttal could be offered and his lips trembled as the depraved vipers journeyed up and around the maiden's nude form. His eyes widened at the unholy display enacted before him, in petrified disbelief as he witnessed the serpents start to violate her. The phantom maiden began to moan with unrighteous pleasure, as the dark-scaled serpent inserted itself head-first between her legs. The crimson serpent coiled around her torso and caressed her. The moans of sinful pleasure began to devolve into screams of damning agony, as if emanating from many throats as the apparition appeared near her climactic release. 
Revolted as the elder priest was at the abhorrent nightmare, he felt as though the clutches of some malign manner would force him to witness the events to their completion. Come now, father. Why deprive yourself? I see the way you were watching. You'd like to fuck me, wouldn't she? Father Carraway, now bearing the strength of will over his body, clamped his eyelids tight and clutched his ears as the wraith-like voice echoed through his head. When he opened his eyes, now full of tears induced by the abysmal madness, he saw that the phantom maiden's appearance had decayed into the same necrotic image he'd spied in the bell chamber at the peak of Black Rock Chapel, complete with the word Frau Schoon carved into her bosom. The burning red serpent began to work its way from her mouth as the abomination's vocals became entirely inhuman altogether. God, give me strength! Father Carraway cried aloud, futilely attempting to free himself from the dread that crippled him. The wraith let out a devious cackle that echoed through the black void before. In the same voice she formerly bore in life, she lashed out, Listen to ye, still thinking Christ cares for ye. Poor little lamb, for ye truly have lost your way. Another ghastly wail of pleasure rang from the phantom maiden's lips, as rivulets of dark warm blood ran down from her complexionless legs before crying out in the echoing and apparitional voice of agony, There is no relief in heaven, no damnation in hell, no forgiveness, no damnation. His blood now frozen in mortal terror at his seemingly inescapable fate at the hands of the malign entity before him, Father Carraway lifted a trembling hand to clutch the crucifix around his neck as he again attempted to choke out the Lord's Prayer. The elder priest was cut off before he could even finish the utterance of, Hallowed be thy name. Legions of painful screams of perpetual sorrow reached a deafening pitch that echoed from around him and within him, forcing his eyes closed from strain and his hands to reflexively cover his ears. Through his fright-induced tears, the elder priest opened his eyes to witness the torso of the unholy phantom begin wriggling as the protrusions of other human faces began to form themselves into her pale, decayed flesh. When the writhing mass of faces took form within the phantom maiden's body, they cried out in unison in deafening wails. Father Carraway was forced to his knees eyes clamped tight and his palms covering his ears. No salvation! The tortured, ethereal voices screamed out as one. Only condemnation awaits us all, for all are debased! The words echoed through the elder priest's shattered mind. No salvation! He tried to hide away the thought, as to attempt to keep his psyche from complete collapse. With great strain, Father Carraway opened his eyes to a small squint, merely enough to perceive from a rudimentary level the mortifying sight of a multitude of serpents advancing upon him from all directions, just as they had in the bell chamber in the chapel's peak. Stripped of any will to mentally or physically resist, Father Carraway watched helplessly as long, writhing black and red serpents exited the mouths of the tormented, screaming faces conjoined to the abomination's body. Though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, thy rod and thy staff, he faintly whispered as he finally resigned himself to whatever damning fate awaited him at the whims of the abhorrent phantom. Just before the darkness could overtake him, however, the elder priest found himself lying in a cold sweat within his bedchamber. His eyes were stitched wide open. The first image he perceived was that of a young maiden. Still, in a perpetual shock, Father Carraway stared at the maiden before him, 
attempting to distinguish his presence from the wraith that menaced him in his slumber. When his eyes studied the olive complexion of her skin, coupled with the long brunette hair beneath her head robe, he realized that the maiden standing before him now was none other than the budding Sister Meredith. His vision slowly strained itself into the clear composition. He could see the young fledgling's eyes glistening with tears and her face red. Oh, Father, thank God you're awake! I thought you were lost forever! exclaimed Sister Meredith through tear-filled relief. In an exhausted voice, Father Carraway questioned the young fledgling nun as to where he was and what had happened, for in the current moment, he could not immediately recollect any of the previous phenomena outside of the demented nightmare he'd only narrowly escaped from. It was awful. After I came back with the authorities for the woman we found in the bell tower... She shuddered before continuing, her voice cracking again with frightful tears. We found you sprawled unconscious on the stairs. You kept muttering the Lord's Prayer and something about serpents and poison. I looked everywhere, but I couldn't find Father Edwards. The body was missing, too. A few of the other sisters and I moved you into your bed. You were out for most of the night and into this morning. I only awoke you when you began thrashing about. A tumultuous wave of dread washed over the elder priest's face as, all at once, the horrors of the previous afternoon came crashing back into his memory like a devastating avalanche. Oh, Father, I'm afraid, cried the young sister Meredith. Something unholy is happening in the chapel. What are we going to do? Father Carraway winced and drew a deep breath, once again grasping the right side of his forehead, attempting to both ease the throbbing pulses inside and regain some semblance of composure to his abilities of reason. His head was drowning in a black whirlpool of insanity and cold, crippling, unforgiving dread. What am I going to do? The bitter question crossed Father Carraway's mind, followed by another disheartening query. What could I do? Father Carraway began hopelessly attempting to connect the ghoulish events to possibly identify the source of the abominable phenomena and combat it with the aid of the divine. Archbishop Marcus, Father Carraway whispered, unconsciously vocalizing his thoughts as his mind traveled back to the encounter at the chapel's peak. What was that, Father? questioned the fledgling nun, unsure yet hopeful that his response to her might be the foundation of a plan to either drive away or flee the evil that presently menaced them. Awakened from his thought-induced trance by Sister Meredith's voice, Father Carraway began to rouse himself from his bed. Listen, child. He gestured to the young sister in an exhausted voice that bore the nature of a man far elder than he. Fetch my priest's garb and my overcoat. Where are you going, father? Pressed the young fledgling nun, unsure of the elder priest's intentions. There may be one that could provide us with aid, for he's dealt with many an evil in his day. He'll know what to do. Now do as I say, child. Make haste. Father Carraway struggled as he slowly moved his aching body still weak from the serpent's potent venom. When his legs finally found the strength to stand, he slowly trudged over to the vanity mirror that hung to the right of the entrance of the bedchamber. It was an average-sized mirror joined on either side by vanilla-scented candles that would provide small tastes of added luminescence to the entirety of the bedchamber. Above the vanity mirror hung a shining silver crucifix bearing a molded image of Christ's executed body fixed upon it. The young fledgling sister Meredith was slightly puzzled, but simply offered a small bow of her head before making her way to the wardrobe. Gazing at his image in the aged mirror, Father Carraway felt a sense of nausea creep upon him. In reality, he had lived only 45 years. 
The face that returned his gaze from the mirror had the appearance of one who had lived closer to 30 years longer. The reflection in the mirror bore thin, silver strands of hair, unlike the thick, vibrant brunette hair he bore outside of the mirror. The skin on the doppelganger's face also appeared haunted and concaved, as though the flesh it bore was too excessive for its bones. The weary elder priest became unnerved at the sight, tugging at the skin on his face to reassure himself through tactile perception that the image in the mirror was indeed some visual hallucination. It was then that the reflection began to shift within the mirror's confines. The face that posed itself as the elder priest began to offer a most sinister grin while the rest of the room surrounding the being began to take on a scarlet red filter. For a moment, his blood chilled at the sight of his reflection acting outside of his own will. Placing his palms over his eyes, he softly whispered, No, it's not real. God be with me. Old fool. Father Carraway looked again at the doppelganger from his palms and saw the sinister reflection begin to decay, the loose skin hanging onto his skull now falling away to expose the skeleton underneath. God cannot save us, lashed the vision in the mirror. His jaw fell as he watched the mirror image slowly evolve into a more grotesque appearance. More of the false reflection's flesh slowly decayed and peeled away as if it were but mere paper to reveal the skull, bearing jagged teeth that could rip and crush flesh and bone alike with ease, without worry of dulling. The sockets of the demon were dark and cavernous voids that swallowed all semblance of light save only for a tiny crimson speck in the middle of either socket, respectively, that appeared to serve as its retinas. Let me ask you something, father, chided the beast in the mirror, voicing the elder priest's title in a tone of mocking reverence. Father Carraway covered his ears to attempt to resist the abomination's lying tongue. Why did your so-called loving father in heaven execute his own son? Father Carraway screamed in his head at the abhorrent creature to silence its blasphemies, to no avail. Christ himself was no more than a holy bastard. The words crashed as boulders in an avalanche in Father Carraway's head. They motivated him to press his palms tighter to his ears and tightly close his eyes. His execution achieved nothing more than penance for his birth as such. The last exclamation rang out in his mind with such ferocity that he could feel his knees attempting to buckle beneath him as if an unseen force was weighing him down. You know it's true, father. Just look at me. I am humankind in its purest state. We are the condemned. Humankind itself, Father, are the very beasts that were sentenced to damnation. Salvation is only the lie you spread. Nearing his wit's end, Father Carraway slammed his fists upon the vanity's surface and shouted defiantly at the apparition. Enough! The mounted crucifix shook before falling from its place above the mirror and landing in front of him. Hearing the faint clatter of the crucifix's descent, the elder priest found himself awakened from another trance. Instead of the detestable specter that occupied its confines only moments before, he saw that his reflection revealed the middle-aged man that existed in reality. Father Carraway again closed his eyes and began drawing in deep breaths to relax. Upon opening his eyes, he decided to refix the fallen symbol back to its original perchance above the vanity mirror. As he held it, however, 
A searing pain shot through the palm of his hand that caused him to drop it again, letting out a cry of pain. Tightly grasping his right hand with his left out of reflex, he gazed once again down at the image of Christ's sacrifice as it began to glow a hot, burning orange. Are you all right, Father? The oppressive odor of brimstone permeated the air within the bedchamber as the priest saw, in revitalized terror, small streams of blood begin to ooze from the wrists, feet, and head of the mold of Christ. Father Carraway spun around and was met with the slightly relieving sight of the young fledgling nun, priest garb and overcoat in hand. I heard something. Did something happen? No, child, replied the elder priest, unsure how to explain the unholy phenomena in her absence. Everything is fine, but there's no more time to be lost. Come now. You will accompany me to the Archbishop's house. He may be the only one who could help us. 3. The pair quietly exited the sanctuary with haste and walked through the town that saw its citizens begin making their way to Black Rock Chapel. Wednesday Mass, Father Carraway muttered, silently chastising himself for the lapse in memory. What is it, Father? queried the budding nun, citing the expression of anxiety on the elder priest's face. Father Carraway, still bearing a worried look, shook his head and blankly reassured her that all that was important was that they sought the archbishop as swiftly as possible. Within another five minutes of walking, they arrived upon a small cottage built from stone and mortar. Fixed upon the front of the wooden door was a silver crucifix hung by a string of rosary beads dangling from an outwardly protruding nail. Above the decoration were inscribed three words in Latin, In nomine patris, in bright red. Is this the archbishop's home? asked Sister Meredith. Indeed, replied Father Carraway. He spotted an air of curious skepticism mold itself on the young fledgling nun's face. Archbishop Marcus always preferred modesty, Father Carraway told her, as he had already anticipated her question. As he reached out to ring the worn-down yet functional bell fashioned to the right of the door, the elder priest briefly recollected a few of his memories of his years under Archbishop Marcus's apprenticeship. He gave the small, frail string that hung the bell two light tugs, hearing the six high-pitched rings of its frail clapper impacting against its interior. In the mere span of a minute after the bell rang its last, the wooden door began to jolt ajar. "'Who seeks my home?' a voice called out from the inside of the cottage. The voice was that of a man far older than Father Carraway. We have sought counsel and aid against a grave and unknown evil that has plagued God's kingdom of Black Rock Chapel. Father Carraway couldn't help but emphasize the urgency of his request for an audience. The cottage entrance was revealed as the wooden door was opened fully. An older man clad in a soft velvet robe was standing in the doorway, with a white cross stitched to the left. Despite his aged appearance, the man stood a solid six feet in height, even dwarfing Father Carraway's mere five feet six inches. The man's head bore a clean shave, bearing only an albino mustache and beard that reached down to his collarbone. For a solid moment that felt stretched, the man in the doorway examined them, evaluating the sincerity and the spoken urgency. Well then, you'd best come inside said the man in the doorway, finally breaking the ever-straining silence and gesturing for them to enter. The pair entered, the older gentleman promptly closing the door behind them. Inside the cottage, the young sister Meredith felt a sense of warm comfort. The walls held different varieties of oils and myrrh. Large, thick, leather-bound volumes were neatly lined atop a shelf perched above the fireplace 
which housed a ferocious blaze. Father Carraway became once again lost in his memories of days past. So tell me, what is this vile menace you beseech my aid for? The question broke the elder priest from his memories. Wasting not an instant, Father Carraway began regaling the Archbishop of the hauntings of the prior two days. As he continued his dreadful accounting of the horrors that occurred in Blackrock Chapel, the elder priest saw the face of the Archbishop become grim, somber, as if he bore some grave piece of the macabre enigma the others didn't. When Father Carraway was finished describing their peril, a long and unsettling silence hung in the air of the cottage. The ground upon which Blackrock Chapel stands wasn't always holy. Archbishop Marcus's voice evoked the same foreboding feeling of sorrow and regret that remained reflected on his aged face. The elder priest himself was hesitant to press the archbishop for a further explanation, as if the hidden revelation could scar him further than what his psyche could recover. You made mention of one Father Edwards, the priest bearing the serpents, yes? Father Carraway nodded in response and offered a, Yes, Excellency, nervously stumbling over his own words. I might have known this day would come again. You no doubt have realized that this Father Edwards is no priest, nor is he a man, at least not any longer. Fear's chilling grasp began to take hold of him once more slowly. The burning question suppressed by hesitation now embedded itself into the forefront of Father Carraway's mind and erupted from his lips. What do you mean, Your Excellency? His heart hung with a heavy pendulum of rueful regret and worry. Archbishop Marcus began to enlighten the pair of the unfortunate tragedy that molded the infancy era of Black Rock Chapel. Before the land that the chapel's foundation rests upon was first consecrated as hallowed soil, it had served as a sanctuary for a coven of gypsy folk. When I first came upon the land, I was as you were when I tutored you. I was a pupil under the tutelage of my predecessor, Archbishop Duncan. It was my first journey abroad for the spread of the gospel. For a brief moment, Father Carraway's mind, with cursory accuracy, recollected small fragments of his initial journey abroad before he was commissioned to the status of priest. His recollection of prior ages halted when the Archbishop's voice began again. When we arrived, it was a mere darkened patch of earth that appeared to bear sparse, if any, vegetation, and in its center a massive, dark stone boulder sat in perchance. I remember that, engraved on its outwardmost surface, was the image of some manner of talisman, with two words in the dialect of the gypsies, Terra Condemnatilor. Only long after the grave events that occurred there did I ever learn what those two words meant, for in our tongue, those words translate as Land of the Condemned. The archbishop's face darkened, the aged features of his face beginning to pronounce themselves by shadow. The dread incubating within Father Carraway tightened its firm grasp on his mind. We wished at first to establish commerce with them. We thought that, through fellowship, we may convert some of them to the Lord's gospel. Archbishop Marcus's eyes fell to the ground in a frightened, stoic gaze as a chilled shudder escaped him. We were wrong. His voice was devoid of any emotion save for petrified trauma. His stare was still fixed to the ground beneath. The archbishop continued in a gravelly voice. Two years passed in harmony until strange occurrences began. Morbid curiosity bested Father Carraway, and he queried Archbishop Marcus as to the implications of the occurrences he referred to. 
At first, we simply brushed them off as minute phenomena, events that we wouldn't try to assign real significance to as they occurred few and far between. However, with the progression of time, the phenomenon became more recurrent and amplified in their malignancy. The other priests in our congregation awoke every night in terror and foretelling of unrighteous envisionings plaguing their sleep, and storms began to grow fierce and unwavering night and day. However, it was one dusk when our paranoia reached an apex, and our goal of peaceful fellowship was abandoned. The cracks of the flames dancing upon the oak kindling inside the hearth arrested the mournful stare of the bishop. Voices. It began with the voices that came to me, whispering unrighteous blasphemies to me. Night upon night, the ghastly voices beckoned to me, tempting me to partake of the ungodly acts they would describe to me. Though the grace and strength of the Lord willed me to resist them, I began to grow worried. I recounted my experiences to another apprentice under the former archbishop's study. The archbishop's gaze met once again with the elder priest. The man you named as Father Edwards. Father Carraway stared in confusion at what he was told. Just before he could question to himself the plausibility of what Archbishop Marcus's implication was, a morbid realization sent a thunderbolt that shook his mind to its innermost foundation. Not a man. Not any longer. The words pierced him like a finely sharpened dagger as he began to slowly piece together the connection between the malign hauntings that menaced him in the previous days within the chapel's walls and those recounted from the archbishop's macabre anecdote. Noting the clarity molding itself to the elder priest's face, Archbishop Marcus continued. He suspected immediately the machinations of the gypsies were at fault. He was certain that their foreign customs had in some form, wrought evil forces against us. Over time, paranoia became disdain and mistrust, until one grave twilight, the night that blind fear drove us to violence. I'll never forget their faces as we came upon them, wielding the instruments that raised their livelihood to ash. Their homes, their shops, Everything was set ablaze by the hands of our convent. The archbishop's mouth split into a morbid, dead smile, wholly devoid of any authentic joy. Edwards told me what we were doing was an exorcism of the land, that our actions were in righteous merit of the Lord's services. A small tear escaped his lifeless eyes and ran down his cheeks. Father Carraway's blood began losing its warmth as he witnessed the collapse of his former mentor's psyche. They fled the land that night, but not before letting slip an omen. May you all be spared of Degasi. As if the mention of the word carried a supernatural force of its own, the hearth exploded outward, and the flames dancing upon the oak kindling shifted erratically. If I could have known of the unholy evils we wrought upon ourselves, Archbishop Marcus's lips quivered as he continued. We thought that by ridding the land of the gypsy heretics from the soil, the evil would flee with them. We were too blinded by arrogance to see at the time that the ones we were swift to drive away were the same whose practices acted not as a weapon against us, but to spare us from something far worse. Degasi? Father Carraway queried, more from instinct than genuine curiosity. A sullen nod of the archbishop's head, coupled with his chiseled expression of recriminatory despair, serve to reply to the query. Like with what was inscribed upon the stone, 
I learned only long after what Degasi was. What is it, Excellency? Is it the name of a demon? Father Carraway asked, attempting to recollect the multitude of malign spirits dwelling from the Lake of Fire that was catalogued in Le Dictionnaire Infernal, a volume he was required to devote hours of study to in his apprenticeship under Archbishop Marcus. Archbishop Marcus arose from his seated position, went to his bookshelf, and pulled out a volume dressed in dirt and dust, adorned by cobwebs. Father, you misunderstand. Degasi is no demon. Blowing away the concealment provided by the dust on the cover, the volume's cover was revealed to be a faded yet polished brown hue, leather-bound, and bearing no title on the front. The archbishop fixed himself with his reading lenses and opened the worn volume halfway, and began turning further pages until he found the specific page bearing the heading of Blestimul Louis de Gassi. Father Carraway gazed intently at the faded page before him, unsure exactly of what to make of the foreign runes scrawled upon the page. Archbishop Marcus placed his index finger upon the passage in question, directing Father Carraway's gaze. When they fled, the coven of gypsies left behind this tome. Archbishop Marcus read the passage that detailed the Blestemul Louis de Gassi, the curse of the debased, in their tongue. Father Carraway's blood chilled, draining his skin pale as he listened to the Archbishop tell of de Gassi as the physical manifestation of humanity's condemnation. The memories of the chapel's phenomena abrasively invaded his mind once again, pronouncing emphatically the gratuitous blasphemies the wraiths assaulted him with. The archbishop further explained that those that fall victim to Degasi do so when they call out to them, seducing them to either embrace whatever sins they committed that drew their attention of them, or stripping them of all hope of salvation until their demise wherein they're to join the ranks of the condemned. As Archbishop Marcus continued reading, the elder priest glanced at the page, when he felt his skin begin to crawl at the sight of the illustration on the page's bottom right corner. The illustration depicted the scene of a man brought to his knees and clutching his forehead as long, black serpents appeared to swarm over his body. The face of the man was craned back to face the sky above. It was twisted into an expression of perpetual agony. The detail of the image that disturbed Father Carraway was a large, dark monolithic stone that stood erect. Protruding from the black stone looked like a cyclonic whirlwind formed from many faces that appeared conjoined, all of them twisted in the same expression of abject horror and sorrow. Spotting this, Father Carraway felt a drag of nausea grasp firmly to him as the recollection of his nightmare forced itself abrasively into the forefront of his thoughts. How has it been taking the form of Father Edwards? Father Carraway queried, using the question to void the malignant event from his mind. The Archbishop fell silent once again, his aged face giving away to its earlier state of mournful despair. As writ in the tome here, Archbishop Marcus began as he placed his index finger upon the excerpting passage he meant to reference, his vocals low and forlorn. Degasi can assume the avatar of any that are of them to walk the earth above. The chilling words returned to Father Carraway. Not a man. Not any longer. Tears began to run freely down Archbishop Marcus's cheeks. Utter despair consuming him, Father Carraway gave in to the compulsion to query Archbishop Marcus about how Father Edwards a servant of the Lord, could have been met with such a fate. We were all lost to righteous arrogance, replied Archbishop Marcus. But Excellency, the elder priest cried out, interrupting the Archbishop's reply, 
How could that alone condemn a servant of Christ? His pride attracted their attention to him, but what he did next allowed them to consume him. With a heavy, shuddering breath, the somber archbishop recollected the event that wrought damnation upon the arrogant priest that Father Carraway once thought of as a brother in faith. The night of the raid, I found him wielding one of the gypsies' own blades against one of the maidens of the coven. She begged for her life in her people's tongue, but his murderous judgment was unbound. I called him, told him to hold his hand. The archbishop froze. His stare became distant as a frightening recollection of the gypsy maiden's screams and the sickening squelch of flesh being penetrated, molded vividly in his mind. A deadly silence hung within the cottage, contested only by the cracks of the kindling beneath the flames that were only ever slightly increased in volume. Father Carraway felt himself in a state of fruitless denial at what he was just told, that a fellow servant of the cross was a murderer and had committed himself to the whims of an unspeakable evil that, even now, wears his face. It was then that a horrific realization revealed itself to him that almost caused him to faint. Who else but Father Edwards could have called the Mass for sermon tonight? Can it be stopped? Sister Meredith queried with a shaking tone of panic seeping into her voice. The young fledgling nun's voice caused the two men to glance at her with mild surprise as, until that instant, her silence had caused them to forget her presence entirely. Before a reply could be offered, a mass of shrill screams in the distance arrested their attention. The three listened to the sound of many clamoring, stampeding footsteps, accompanied by a collective cacophony of frightened screams. Father Carraway opened the cottage's front door to reveal that the source of the sounds was the townsfolk who had gathered for mass before, now fleeing Black Rock Chapel for their very lives. The full magnitude of the mortifying display caused the elder priest to fall to his knees in a trance of terror-induced shock. Father Carraway! exclaimed Sister Meredith as she rushed to him urgently. Archbishop Marcus exited the cottage into the midst of the chaos. What's going on? the Archbishop demanded of a fleeing youth farmhand. Monster! In the sanctuary! cried the farmhand before pushing past the Archbishop. Once his stance was regained, Father Carraway waded through the horde of fleeing congregation until he found Archbishop Marcus once again. It's Degasi. It must be. Tonight was Wednesday Mass. It was a trap! The elder priest exclaimed with staggered breath. With a cold, icy, and stoic glare carved into his aged face, Archbishop Marcus turned to Father Carraway and said, we must destroy the evil of Blackrock. How? Father Carraway queried, remembering his encounters with the frightening entity and the lack of effect of his holy objects with warding them away. In a grave tone, Archbishop Marcus answered, By fire this evil was born. Through the fire, so too shall it die. The two continued pushing through the terrified churchgoers, climbing up the steps and thrusting the chapel's entrance open. 4. Inside the hallway to the sanctuary, the clutter of overturned mahogany and discarded crucifix trinkets littered the long, crimson-hued carpet that lined the main hall. However, the sight that disturbed the two clergymen most about the chaos displayed before them were the empty garments that lay discarded, as if those that formerly bore them had simply vanished. The elder priest froze, the blood flowing through his veins chilled as he witnessed the forms of long, thin serpents extrude their scaly forms from the empty garments. Come now, there's no time to lose! 
The archbishop shouted as he retrieved the frankincense from the drawer that kept the oils and wine regularly used for the occasion of communion. Father Carraway remained in place as he retrieved the oil and dismounted two of the candlesticks, the malign phenomena burrowing back into his recollections, feeling incapable of acknowledging his partner's voice. The elder priest felt the taunts uttered by the wraiths sink slowly and painfully into his heart. If God's forgiveness is divine, how are we so many that are condemned? No relief in heaven, no damnation in hell, no forgiveness. Salvation is only the lie you spread. They have shown me the truth, Father. There is no salvation. Those two last words, which had haunted him for three days and nights, began to repeat as though they were some manner of a demented mantra, screaming inside his mind like a chorus of shrieking maidens in great pain. Father Carraway's trance was broken when he felt an object pushed into his chest. Father, are you ready to begin? Archbishop Marcus queried, pushing one of the candlesticks into the center of Father Carraway's chest. Clarity resuming control of his thoughts, the elder priest replied with a slightly hesitant breath, Yes, I'm ready. Then may we exorcise the evil from Christ's temple, Archbishop Marcus declared with the blaze of determination raging in his eyes. As they set about dousing the main hall in the frankincense, crossing each stream they cast upon the surroundings, they each began to recite, In nomine Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Until Archbishop Marcus let out a sharp cry of pain that abruptly ended his chanting. Startled, Father Carraway snapped his head in the Archbishop's direction. His jaw slacked numbly as he spotted five of the abhorrent serpents with their fangs fixed firmly within his former mentor's thighs. Archbishop Marcus's eyes were fastened tight, his jaw agape as his face portrayed the sheer unutterable pain that coursed within him at that moment. Father Carraway began to rush to the Archbishop's aid, shock and panic molding into one as he saw his ally forced to his knees in agony. No! Archbishop Marcus screamed out with a strained cry. Stay away! The elder priest halted, despite the fright-induced adrenaline urging him further. His strength waning, the Archbishop summoned the last of his will to let out a strained cry to Father Carraway. It's too late! I'm theirs now! I allowed this evil to birth. Now you must destroy it. Another tortured wail escaped Archbishop Marcus's mouth as the serpents swarmed him, biting and coiling themselves up and around his body and into his gaping mouth. As they burrowed into his throat, he let out a series of choking gasps. However, before the serpents could overtake him, Archbishop Marcus sputtered one last command to the petrified elder priest. You... you must burn Black Rock Chapel! His eyes rolled back as the breath of life left him, falling fully on his back. Father Carraway's legs felt weak as he watched helplessly as the body of Archbishop Marcus became but a mere squirming mass of dark and crimson. The serpents then dispersed from where the Archbishop's body lay. Only the empty velvet robe remained and scurried away collectively as though they were answering some summons. His gaze followed their flight, and Father Carraway saw them slithering back into the sanctuary. Giving pursuit, Father Carraway's eyes met with the embodiment of the horror that tormented the once hallowed ground he stood upon. The abomination stood at the pulpit, arms outstretched as if exerting the very force that beckoned the serpents to it. 
The head of the abysmal creature was the likeness of the man Father Carraway formerly knew as Father Edwards. However, the rest of the beast's form comprised little more than a writhing mass of faces that appeared twisted in the same expression of unbridled suffering. Father Carraway stood at the sanctuary entrance, pale, struggling to comprehend the full extent of the unholy terror displayed before him as the multitude of serpents burrowed themselves in the many dark, cavernous mouths of the agonized faces that comprised the abomination's form. The tortured faces began to undulate more rapidly, as if attempting to breach through the flesh, confining them until a new addition began to mold itself into the center of the abomination's chest region. In anguish, Father Carraway cried out, No! when he witnessed the agonized face of his former mentor take form in the monstrosity's flesh. As he fell to his knees, stripped of his will, he felt as though he were once again in the nightmare, now with no relief of waking from it. Now you see the truth, brother. Even the pious cannot be forgiven. Haunting familiarity struck the elder priest's ears when the voice of a young man though still inhuman in nature, chided him. The truth stands before you. No salvation. Though uttered singly by the false likeness of Father Edwards, the voice bore an ethereal quality to it that wholly devoid its resemblance to that of a human. He realized this to be the distorted vocals of the young adolescent from the confessional. Now you see the truth, brother. Even the pious cannot be forgiven. The truth stands before you. No salvation. The eyes of the false priest's likeness rolled back unnaturally into his skull. It distended its jaws, regurgitating a large, squirming legion of black serpents. They slithered in haste to claim the elder priest. Father Carraway, witnessing this physical incarnation of horror, almost resigned to his fate when he remembered the candlestick he still wielded. The frankincense, he nearly shouted aloud, holding his tongue to not reveal his plan to the monster. With renewed hope, Father Carraway found himself at his feet. More dark serpents came forth out of the dark orifices of the mass of twisted faces. Running to the empty velvet robe, Father Carraway retrieved the half-empty jar of the holy oil and doused the sanctuary. Triumphantly, he raised the candle aloft, ready to set the room ablaze, when a succession of sharp pains shot through his left leg. He looked down to see that a serpent had fixed its fangs on him. Father Carraway once again felt the venom's crippling effects begin to claim him within less than seconds. His head throbbed, and his vision began to fail him. Nausea finally stripped his legs of his ability to stand, forcing him to collapse. As the serpents began to overtake him, Father Carraway, with the last of his strength, raised the jar of frankincense and doused himself. In a weakened breath, the elder priest uttered, Though I walk in the shadow of the valley of death, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I will fear no... His defiant speech was cut short as two of the serpents forced themselves into his throat. Father Carraway thrust the candle's flame upon himself, setting himself and the serpents ablaze. The scorched serpents hissed as they fled hastily from the elder priest's burning body. Within mere minutes, the entirety of the sanctuary was an inferno. The burning serpents slithered to the spaces dredged in the frankincense in their panic, the agonized faces fixed within the abomination's flesh began to shriek in a uniformed cacophony of pain as the searing grasp of the flames came upon them. As the abomination's flesh charred, 
The mass of faces began to protrude further from the form until breaking free of the flesh that held them bound, sending forth a cyclone of wailing apparitions that swarmed the burning sanctuary. All through the night, the flames gutted Black Rock Chapel. When the sun rose, naught was left but hot, smoldering rubble. Seven sunsets passed, with many folks attempting to speculate and ponder what had happened that night. I heard some bloody priest went mad, set the whole damn chapel on fire, himself included, exclaimed a young man to the bartender. <laughs> oh, you're spouting fouler smelling shit than what my farmhands used to grow my crops with, the bartender retorted with a hearty laugh. Scoff all you want. I know what I heard. I know the truth. Do you now? The patron seated upon the neighboring bar stool uttered. The young lad was taken back by his mute neighbor's somewhat abrupt and unexpected query. Well, <laughs> sure. The young man finally replied with an uneasy chuckle. Then the stranger looked at the lad, locking the nervous eyes with his cold gaze. He had full dark brunette hair and a young youthful face, despite appearing twice his age. The stranger also appeared clad in a dark robe, similar to what the young lad had seen worn by preachers. Say, you wouldn't happen to be a priest, would you? The stranger's mouth parted upward at the left corner in dry amusement. I was, once, he said in the same dry tone, nearly devoid of emotion. But then, I learned the truth. The young lad, suspecting some manner of a bluff, challenged him. That right. Now what would that be, holy man? Still bearing the same devious grin, the supposed former priest told the young man to follow him behind the tavern if he wished to be bestowed with the truth he offered. The young man obliged and followed as a pig to slaughter. Within seconds, the lad's confident arrogance was replaced with sheer terror as the stranger opened his robe to reveal a writhing mass of tortured faces of pain branded into his flesh. Like you, the stranger began. I was too arrogant to accept the truth, but I know now. It's as they told me. Salvation is only the lie we spread, for all are condemned in the end. The former priest displayed a menacingly joyous smile as a horde of black and crimson-scaled serpents silenced the young lad's screams. Money talks, always has. That's what brought me to the Syndicate, after all. I was fresh off the force, facing eviction, just sort of wandering without direction. I had applied to any job I figured a guy like me could get my hands on. Security guard for a bank, bodyguard for some unappreciative 20-year-old man-child. Hell, I'd even thought about getting my bail bondsman license. All were met with conceited sighs and, sorry, we're not hiring, try again later in the year. That's easy to say when you're not worried about putting food on the table, or if you can even make rent. Figuring a few bottles of feel-good could take my mind off the situation for a couple of hours. I decided to do what anyone with little money would do in my situation and went to wash my sorrows away at the local dive bar. There in that small town shithole, leaning on a sticky weathered bar top, I met Mr. Beck. Rough day? I looked around and saw that the place was dead, except for one man. 
he wasn't just talking to thin air. That easy to tell, huh? I said, draining the last drops from my fourth beer. He chuckled a greasy, almost weasel-like laugh. Always can tell a man down on his luck. That's how I make a living. He sauntered over, plopping on the stool next to mine and outstretching his hand. Wilson Beck, talent scout. Marcus Kent, not interested in your pyramid scheme. Again, I heard the same weasel-like laughter. You misunderstand me, Mr. Kent. I'm not in that line of business. He reached inside the lining of his suit and retrieved a nondescript black business card, sliding it across the bar in my direction. Alpha Syndicate Consolidation Services. He spoke almost in a whisper. Turning over the front of the card revealed the same jet black background with embossed gold lettering. Its logo was simple, the Roman symbol for Alpha entwined with the Omega symbol arching above. The card was void of a phone number or email. Hell, there wasn't even a website. Just simple coordinates. One of my eyebrows cocked up in confusion as I looked back at the man. Is this a joke? I asked. He chuckled coolly and shook his head. Not a joke at all, my good sir, but an interview. A chance for a new, exciting world of employment and the opportunity to make more money than you could ever spend. He made the classic gesture of rubbing his thumb against his fingers. I see. Any particular reason you're peddling the pitch to me? I'm not a banker or stock trader or whatever it is you do. A small smirk graced his face. We have no use for bankers, brokers, or businessmen. We require men and women who aren't afraid to get their hands dirty. People who live to feel that adrenaline rush as they dive into the great unknown. An aptitude with firearms doesn't hurt either. Judging by the haircut and build, I'd bet that you were either law enforcement or recently separated from the military in a town full of farmers and fishermen. Either way is a big bonus with our hiring manager. My eyes went wide. This guy was good. Either that or just lucky. I turned the card around in my hands and looked over at him. I was desperate. I doubted this opportunity would present itself twice, no matter how shady it seemed. What do I need to do? I had no idea what to expect on the long drive up the trail to the facility. The driver weaved between the Tennessee wilderness pines, heading up a steep embankment, nearly vertical. I was awestruck by the view. Pine trees peaked above dense fog as far as the eye could see. There was nothing man-made for miles around. No telephone or power lines, no radio towers or even fire watch stations. Completely bare and untouched by man. We've arrived, sir. The posh driver looked at me through the rearview mirror. I nodded and stepped out of the vehicle. Our final destination was a huge black complex complete with office windows and a revolving door. A testament to corporate America, sitting in the middle of nowhere. I wondered if I belonged to this place, but there seemed to be no turning back. Soon enough, I heard the jeep and driver speed off down the mountainside. I supposed there was nowhere to go now but in. Orientation was a blur. Many medical screenings, standard gear assignments, and numerous PowerPoints about policy and standards. I still didn't know what I was actually doing with all this information. After lunch, those questions were answered when I was led into a small briefing room. Before me sat five people. All were decked out in the newest tactical gear, and everyone seemed less than enthused upon seeing me. Doc, what's up with the new guy? A blonde-haired man stuck his thumb in my direction. His face was dirty and tan except for around the eyes. The baseball cap pulled backward hid his shaggy mane. 
He's covering down as the fifth man since we lost Garcia, an older gentleman said. His long gray hair tied back in a ponytail gave some sense of professionalism, yet his beard could have belonged to your standard mountain man. The blonde haired man piped up again. So first Garcia goes and croaks, putting us down a guy. Now we have to babysit some new blood who hasn't even been in the field? Yes, the old man retorted. And you will sit down, shut up, and deal with it, or you can stay your ass here. I don't have a problem finding two replacements in one day. There was a moment of silence as the older man narrowed his eyes at the blonde. Suddenly, with a clearing of the throat, he stood up and faced me. Nice to meet you. Marcus, right? I nodded, trying not to fumble my words. Uh, yes, nice to meet you. I stretched my hand out in an attempt to shake his, though he just looked at it and back to me. Good to have you, man. My name's Trevor, but feel free to call me Doc. I'm the resident medic and squad leader here. Welcome to Whiskey Team. He pointed to an empty chair and then to the other people in the room. This here is Paige. He pointed to a slightly older woman with long, dark hair and brown eyes. It was hard to place her origin, but she gave off a slightly Central American vibe. Lead engineer and second in command. You need something and can't find me, you go to her. She gave me a wave. Trevor jerked his thumb to the end of the table, to a large black gentleman with thick glasses. That's Wade, heavy weapons specialist. Good to meet you, man, Wade growled out. Likewise. Trevor concluded with a heavy sigh. And this is Eric. He's the best shot in this place, Eric chimed in. A scowl came across Trevor's face. Eric is our marksman and scout. You will be filling the role as point man in the outfit. Point man? But what is it we actually do? I said, a bit exasperated. A chuckle broke out from the group. Well, that answers the question as to what they tell the new joins. He grabbed a remote and pointed it to a small television on the wall opposite mine. What we do is this. He clicked the remote. On screen, I saw a recording of armed shooters assaulting a building. They breached the door, moving in tactically, sweeping the halls, scanning every inch of the area. They walked in step, their footsteps echoing down the corridor, yet that wasn't the only noise I was able to hear. A sick suckling sound permeated the air, sounds of gluttonous chewing and swallowing over and over. The men crept closer, and I heard other sounds. The sounds of people screaming, begging against everything for something to stop. Bones snapping like twigs. The gushing of liquids being splattered against the walls. The men stepped forward even quieter than before and stacked on a slightly ajar door as they got ready to go in. The last thing I heard in the video was what sounded like a woman. She was weeping, bawling uncontrollably, and praying from what I could discern. Lord, forgive us, for we know not what we do. A boot kicked open the door, all weapons pointing in the same direction. And then I could see it. The figure before me on the screen was something so twisted, so horrible that I wouldn't be able to dream it up in my worst nightmare. It was sickly green, its body covered in gangrenous, pus-filled sacks. Its legs were twisted and gnarled, longer than any creature I had ever seen. The arms looked broken and irregular as they gripped a man, lifting him effortlessly in the air. The deep indentations leading up to the creature's neck opened, revealing a large, gaping maw with razor-sharp teeth. It devoured the man whole, chewing him. 
The sickening sounds of bones breaking and grinding on skin mixed with his last dying gasp as he was pushed down into the creature's swollen belly. It turned to look at the men. Its soulless black husks of eyes stared at the soldiers lifelessly. With a cracking of the concrete floors, it burst forward to them. Put it down, I heard a familiar voice say through the radio. Machine guns erupted. After a few seconds, the smoke cleared and the creature lay still, its body riddled with bullet holes as the men stepped further into the room. They scanned the area. It looked like some lab, complete with test equipment and chemistry stations. Blood and viscera covered the room as well as bodies. Some were slashed and gutted, some were half-eaten, organs strewn through the floor. Secure the package and burn the body. The voice chirped out again, and the camera turned to see a woman. Her eyes were wide and shaking, the mascara that was once there now running down her face. The person behind the camera grabbed her, causing her to let out a blood-curdling scream. Package secure. A gruff British voice radioed back as the camera turned. Two men covered the creature in kerosene and struck a match, lighting its body ablaze. Roger, prep for Exfil. The men left the room as the video cut to black. I sat there in silence. So many thoughts came to my head. I would have asked if the footage was a hoax or something. Finally, the words came out as straightforward as they could be. What the fuck was that? I shouted. Who were they? Was that real? I was standing now, talking a mile a minute. That can't be real. What the hell? I stopped as I noticed everyone was smirking. Aw, oh, I love this part. When they're all scared and nervous, never gets old. Eric laughed and gave me a contemptuous look. Buckle up, Buttercup, cause it gets way worse than that. Trevor came over and put a hand on my shoulder. I could tell he was trying to handle this conversation with a bit of tact. That, he began, is what happens when a pharmaceutical nonprofit uses herbs found from a Mayan tomb in hopes of synthesizing a drug to help cure sterility and injects it into a test subject. Needless to say, it didn't go over too well. We, as well as the government, were notified of the outbreak 72 hours before insertion. A senator's daughter was working there at the time. He paid for her safe extraction and elimination of threat if able. That was what you saw. He narrowed his eyes. That's what we do, Marcus. We bite back at the things that go bump in the night and make a killing cleaning up the messes of the paranormal and occult. So, you have a choice. Walk out that door now and forget about everything you've witnessed today. It's not like anyone would believe you. Or... He tightened his grip on my shoulder. Stay and become wealthy beyond your wildest dreams. Or option C, Eric chimed in. Get murked by some cosmic horror and let us take your cut. Shut it, Eric. Trevor replied sternly. So, what'll it be? A few hours later, I found myself sitting in a dimly lit briefing room. After agreeing to take the spot on the team, I was whisked away to the supply area and fitted with my new attire. In this case, cargo pants, a long sleeve black shirt, and a plate carrier able to better protect my chest and back from any unfriendly fire boots, and a boonie hat. I was then issued my Beretta pistol and an M4, short and sturdy. They wanted to issue me weapons that would feel familiar to me based on prior experience. Trevor and Paige worked perfectly in sync, tossing rifles back and forth, loading them and checking the sights. Wade grunted in the corner as he hefted a massive belt-fed monster up onto his shoulders. Eric held his bolt-action rifle like a father would hold a child as he gently oiled the bolt-carrier group. 
We were then ushered into a small classroom with a projector pointed toward the board. Everyone took their places, each taking their own desk. A small, stubby woman walked in through the door five minutes later. She wore a green pantsuit and expensive diamond earrings, which tried and failed at distracting from her odd, bowl-style haircut. Apparently, there was no time for introductions as she grabbed the remote to the projector and clicked it, revealing a rather tall man with short, graying hair. His face looked weathered and leathery, with eyeglasses from a different era hanging low off of his broken nose. This is Rohair Anderson. The woman broke the room's silence with a low, monotone drool. A known archaeologist from London specializing in the Egyptian dynasties. She clicked the remote again, pulling up a satellite image of a desert with several red circles drawn around a few entrances to what seemed like caves. Mr. Anderson has been on an expedition for the past few months in the Wadi Heaton National Park, west of Fayum, trying to discern the significance of the people's worship of the god known as Sobek. He sought to extract his knowledge from some of the few recently unearthed tombs along the area. His expected arrival back to London was supposed to be January 12th, six days ago. The woman paused. His estate seemed rather worried as Mr. Anderson has never missed a deadline before. Their first thought was to contact Egyptian law enforcement to send a search party. That was until yesterday when we received this audio transmission. She clicked the remote. H Hello? A male British accent came over the speaker. Short, raspy breaths came over the audio. He sounded out of breath and manic. Found coin. World shattering. Masterpiece. Can't sleep. Stay. Stay away. His once calm voice went wild. He shouted incoherently and babbled before finding his composure. Please help me. F find the valley. Beware the Nile. Then the audio stopped. The woman looked unfazed. Naturally, this audio found its way to us. Mr. Anderson's estate has paid the sum of $750,000 for his safe return and delivery of whatever item he seems to have found. Planned departure from a private hangar in Nashville International Airport will take place in three hours. Grab your briefings on the way out. She shut off the presentation and walked back out of the room. Eric was the first to speak as the lights came up. Well, it's good to see Susan in such a chipper mood. Trevor let out a heavy sigh. He stood and grabbed a manila folder, thumbing through the paperwork. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen the woman smile. Regardless, I suppose we've got a job to do, so be happy about that. He looked in my direction. Don't worry, man. We get the guy in whatever shit he shouldn't be messing with and get him back to the queen. Simple snatch and grab. We'll be back home before you know it and you'll be a hundred grand richer. He said it in such a casual manner, it seemed impossible to believe. I'm sorry, did you say a hundred grand? As in a hundred thousand dollars? Well, technically a hundred and thirty-five thousand, Paige chimed in. 750,000 minus the 10% the company takes off and then divided by five for the team. I looked over and saw her rolling a few cigarettes for the journey. She looked up and smiled at me. Not the most lucrative job we've pulled, but a decent one to get you started, you know. I stood there in shock for a moment. I never considered that I could ever earn so much at one time in my life. A folder hitting my chest broke me from daydreaming as Trevor looked at me sternly. Focus up. You got the job. Now make sure you stay alive to enjoy the payday. Read the report. Get familiar with what we're doing and be ready to hit the ground running once we touch down. He looked around the room. Grab your shit and get to the car park. We leave in ten. The drive to the airport was fairly uneventful. I sat in the front passenger seat listening to the local top 100 as I thumbed through the report. Anderson seemed like a normal guy. Eccentric, maybe, but nothing out of the ordinary. 
He made his fortune in the early 90s, bringing back a treasure trove of ancient religious relics. His claim to fame, however, was his theories of mummification. There were files upon files dissecting his claim that certain rites were conducted, not in an attempt to preserve the body for the great beyond, but to appease something that resided here on Earth. He argued that once the internal organs were removed, there was evidence that a ritualistic offering took place beneath certain temples, though for what reason he didn't say. Good to see you're studying, Trevor said. Uh, trying to, anyway. I sure hate to run into something like y'all did in that video. Oh, that? Kid, I'm not scared of things that can be brought down with enough lead. The shit that gets back up after emptying a mag, that scares me. The car grew quiet again for a while. Before I knew it, we had pulled onto the tarmac and stopped. All right, Trevor said. Everyone on. The jet was pretty ritzy. Dark tinted windows and enough space for us all to get some rest before landing, complete with a small kitchen and fridge for all we could need. I had nearly forgotten what I was doing here as I leaned my chair back into a makeshift bed and watched as we took off. The excitement must have worn me out, because I nodded off and didn't wake up until I felt the rumble of the aircraft as we touched down. The cabin lights came on as Trevor walked the aisle, rousing each of us. He was already in full tactical gear with his rifle slung across his chest. Rise and shine, team. Early bird gets the worm and whatnot. Grab your gear, clean up your trash, and get the hell off. Locals will be meeting us with trucks in about 30 minutes. I want to get into the desert before I start getting sunburned. Groans of protest echoed throughout the cabin, particularly with Eric, who managed to grumble out, Five more minutes! before being jerked up by Trevor, who handed him his bags. I quickly cleaned my area, grabbed my rifle, and set off to see the landscape. Holy shit. Once my eyes adjusted to the pink dawn sky, that was all I could think. It looked like something out of a postcard. Sunken ancient buildings. The wind cut through the deep brown sand on the massive dunes in the distance. This was an ancient place. Holy and peaceful. First time in Egypt? Paige nudged my arm, yelling to speak over the turbines. First time out of Tennessee! I gave her a half smile. Always wanted to leave, just didn't. She smiled widely and let out a small laugh. <laughs> Get used to it, rookie. Honestly, we rarely pull jobs in the States. She hiked her bag up to her shoulder and headed down the stairs. That's odd. Figure with all the Indian graveyards and shit like Salem, we'd have something there. She sucked in through her teeth and shuddered. God, no. That's Bruja stuff. Spirits and witchcraft. We handle the more tangible side of the occult. Doesn't do us any good if we can't shoot something now, does it? I nodded. Watching her take her pack and throw it to the ground, I followed her lead, facing the soon-to-be rising sun. Question, where are we? I figured we'd be in Cairo or something, like an actual airport. Why are we in the middle of nowhere? I looked over at her, catching her as she quickly closed a locket and pushed it underneath her vest. Syndicate aircraft are piloted by some of the best in the world, she continued. The jets themselves also are designed for vertical takeoff and landing. Put it all together and it's usual to land closer to the site than hoof it in on foot or by car. Saves us a few hours of mission time. Just a shame they have height and weight limits. Wade's deep voice grumbled out, suddenly next to me. He sounded like a Rottweiler if it could talk. Deep and dangerous. Wasted my time getting a pilot's license only to be told I was too big for their seats. He slung his bag down the same as Paige and pulled his machine gun from his shoulders in one fluid motion, planting the stock in the ground and cracking the desert floor. I cocked an eyebrow at his comment. I must have looked a little skeptical as he returned the same expression. What? You were a pilot? 
I don't know, you don't seem like the type. He answered with a shrug. I also went to seminary school. Wouldn't believe that either, would you? Half his face curled in a grin while he pulled a book from his pocket. Yep, Wade's full of surprises, newbie. Eric came around his side, fighting off a yawn. Uh, stick around long enough, he may even tell you where he's from. This brought a round of laughter from the rest of the team, even Wade. Uh, I, I don't get it. What's so funny? Wade shook his head. Nothing, man. Just sort of an inside joke. You'll find out soon enough. Hopefully, Eric chimed in, putting a hand-rolled cigarette between his lips. I caught Paige rolling her eyes. You're gonna be fine, rookie. Just remember the golden rule. Always trust. Cut the chatter! Trevor's voice came from behind us. It wasn't quite a yell, but it commanded the same respect. We all turned back to look at him as he pointed east. They're here. The locals that dropped the trucks off were friendly enough. They seemed a bit on edge. Just really twitchy and constantly looking around. Honestly, their body language was the only thing about them that stood out. They wore white ponchos draping down to their waists, with matching white pants tied off at the shins. Some black leather sandals lashed up their legs. The only things that looked odd were the black bandanas they wore with the golden symbol of the syndicate stenciled on the fabric under the left eye. Well, that and the 45s holstered to their hips. They never spoke, not once. Just nodded at Trevor, who returned the gesture. Two trucks, two sets of keys. Trevor and Eric took the lead while I rode with Paige and Wade at the wheel. Soon as the door shut, Wade reached over from the driver's seat and popped open the glove compartment. Inside lay three black pieces of plastic, each shaped like a small crescent moon. He handed one to me before tossing the second to Paige, hooking it in place and pushing the plastic over his ear. Calm channel, lets us keep in contact. Put it in. I looked down at the plastic. Pretty unassuming. However, I heard the audio crackle, hooking it in, vibrating against my ear. Trevor's voice came over shortly after. All right, this is Whiskey 1. Give me a comm check. Let me know everything's working. Whiskey 2 online, Paige responded matter-of-factly. Whiskey 3, good to go, Wade growled. Why do you need me to say anything? I'm right here... The sound of a smack came through, followed by Eric's cry of pain. Ow! Fuck, man! Whiskey 4, filing an HR complaint. Whiskey 5 online, I said, stifling my laughter. Roger, I heard the audio crackle one last time before phasing out as we drove into the dunes. We're about 80 clicks out from location. We'll be there within the hour. The Syndicate definitely ensured we had the top of the line with anything we needed. While Wade was busy getting one of the trucks up a steep embankment of sand and Paige rested her head against the window, I took the time to check over all my equipment. Nothing was repurposed, reused, or secondhand. My rifle still had a fresh out of the box smell to it. It was hard not to feel excited to use the thousands of dollars of gear strapped to my body or clutched in my hands almost enough to make me forget that I could be shit out of some Frankenstein's monster by the end of the night. Fuck it, I thought. I laid my head against the rest, watching the dunes rise and fall as the trucks cut through the sand. That's a problem for future me. The sharp jolt of skidding brakes made my eyes snap open. It took me a minute to get my bearings. The ride over was only supposed to be an hour. When did it get so dark? Only when I looked out the other window did I realize the sun was still shining, high and hot. The difference was that my window looked out into the mouth of a massive cavern. It would have easily swallowed a good-sized mall, flanked on the sides by two massive sandstone pillars, the inside lit by a bevy of torches. I was beginning to understand the scope of this hellhole we were about to walk into. Shit, 
I muttered as I stepped out of the truck, my foot crunching softly against the compacted desert floor. Who you tellin'? Wade came around, eyes still glued to the cave. Doc, I hope you got a map for the inside, he shouted. Trevor was leaning against his truck, finishing off a cigarette. He nodded, flicking the embers and walking over. Radioed ahead to request an escort inside. They're on the way out now. They seem pretty skittish, though. I didn't think guarding a jumpy little Brit would be all too difficult, but they can't wait to get the hell out of here. Something about bad dreams, I think. My Arabic is pretty rusty, though, so they may just need to take a piss. We all laughed and kept looking around, studying the entrance. I had to turn to get a good look at its entirety. Something about it seemed off. I can't explain, but it felt like it wasn't supposed to be here. The more I looked, the more I felt wrong with it. It gave me the chills, like this wasn't a cave that we were going into, but the mouth of a monster. I stiffened up when I felt a hand clasp my shoulder. Easy, killer. It's just me, Trevor said. Just checking to make sure you ain't having any second thoughts. He pulled out another smoke, lighting it in one swift motion, and took a drag. I smirked and gestured for my cigarette. He obliged and offered a lighter. I took a drag, letting the fresh smoke hit my lungs. Not yet, but I'll let you know when I do. He nodded and faced the mouth of the cave. Man, I'll tell you, you definitely lucked out on your first stop. Oh yeah? Why's that? I remember my first job. Running through the Appalachians, hunting skinwalkers, tripping through trees and falling in stagnant lakes in the middle of the night. Can't do much better than bright and sunny. I thought we didn't pull jobs in the States. I said, cocking an eyebrow. Ah, we used to. It seems that most of the baddies don't like being hunted in their backyard, so they migrated elsewhere. So we haven't seen much in the past 15 years. I almost dropped the cigarette in shock. You do all these jobs and still work after over a decade? Two decades! Trevor exhaled smoke through his nose, looking over at me from the corner of his eye. Got a problem with that? Not really, just why not retire? I'll quit when they do, he answered. He jutted his chin forward to point at the man hustling out of the cave. Time to go to work. Despite Trevor's earlier claims to be rusty in the guard's native language, he could converse with him fairly well. The guard was a short man with the same apparel as the ones who dropped off the trucks, though this guy was nowhere near as composed as the other two. He ran up to us, clutching at Trevor and excitedly telling him something. Physically, he looked rough, to say the least. His face was greasy and covered in sweat, his beard broken off into twists. His eyes, though, they looked like the ones you'd see in a picture of someone coming back from World War II like he had aged years in such a short time. He squinted through his swollen eyes so I could barely see the glassy whites. Whatever had happened to him, he was worse off for it. All right, Trevor said, turning back to us. Atten here is going to lead us back to Mr. Anderson. Once there, we'll be extracting himself and his co-worker. Anderson will be in our care till we touch down in the UK, then we hand the lunatic off, say thank you for the cash, and fuck off back stateside. Good to go? He paused, scanning our faces. We nodded in agreement. Good. Watch your step inside. Even though we have a lit path, I'm sure there will be places to get lost on the way in. Eric, you'll be in the back providing security and picking up any stragglers you find. Wade will be back there as well for support. Page with me. Marcus? He looked over at me. You'll be on point with Atten. Time to shine, kid. Try not to get us lost. Whatever we thought of the cave from the outside was eclipsed by how deep it was on the inside. We must have walked for the better half of an hour, squeezing ourselves through narrow, damp fissures, 
crawling through holes that no one could even remotely call stable, and holding on for dear life as we tiptoed along narrow ledges, praying we wouldn't fall into the darkness below. When my feet hit the solid ground, we moved into the next chamber. However, I wished we could go back. We stood on a plateau, overlooking what could only be described as a massive underground sea. It was quiet, but I could still hear that settling sound that lakes make when there's nothing around to drown it out. I couldn't even see the walls surrounding the cliff we were on except for the one behind me. I had to grab onto it to steady myself from getting vertigo. Then I felt this overwhelming urge to look behind me and turned my attention to the wall. It was carved with ancient symbols and hieroglyphics. They started insignificantly, a single line here, a symbol or two there. Yet as we approached the far wall where the torches were gathered, the symbols seemed to open and flood the landscape. Hell, there was even writing along with a ceiling, all indecipherable and strange, yet they seemed to originate from one source, the open stone mouth of a giant block crocodile. The statue towered over us. Standing close to 30 feet tall, you could impale someone on the giant meat hooks of its teeth. Below its gaping mouth sat a massive stone table, anciently ornate and arcane. This wasn't something you'd ever find in a history book. This place wasn't hidden by the people of the time. It had been banished, left to rot away so that no one would have to bear the sight of it. I felt the familiar touch of Trevor's hand on my shoulder, causing me to jump. Game face on, he whispered into my ear. Don't let anyone, least of all the customer, know how freaked out you are. You're the heavy artillery here. Mercs aren't afraid of the dark, kid. Take a breath, grit your teeth, and get your bearings. Wait for the guys and meet us up there. You're doing fine. I nodded as he looked at me, his eyes steely. He returned the gesture and then looked at Paige. They walked on, scanning the area with every step. It wasn't too much longer, maybe 20 minutes, when Wade's hulking mass stomped into the dim torchlight. Eric pulled up the rear, his wiry frame looking even skinnier next to the bigger man. How's it hanging, newbie? Piss yourself yet? Eric smirked as he slung his rifle onto his shoulders. Happy to disappoint. What took you all so long? Sandstorm, Wade said, looking around taking everything in full. Had to cover the trucks. Not sure how long it'll last, but it looks bad. Murphy's Law, right? Eric's smile seemed a bit more genuine as he gave my chest a firm slap. Come on, let's join the others. To say that Rohair Anderson was a bit more off-kilter since we had heard the recording back at the complex would be an understatement. In the photographs, the once stoic and proud-looking Brit was now an unhinged nutcase caked in grime, glasses cracked, greasy hair flowing down to his shoulders, and more concerned with how rocks tasted than the five new people that stood around him. They only said bring him back alive. Well, look on the bright side, Eric said, looking around the man. The floor was littered with old books, candy bar wrappers, and what I hoped was mud. Alive! The old man jumped up. He grabbed Eric by his vest, shaking him vigorously. He was pretty strong for an old crazy guy. One life, many lives, your life. All just simple puppets in a show put on by the gods. This beast forever scorned as the, the villain. He blinked rapidly like he was trying to think of the next verse to his sermon. Um, who are you again? Your rescue party, Eric said, shoving him back on his ass. And this had better not be what I think it is, he shouted, wiping a brown smudge off his shirt. Oh, yes, quite. My rescuers. You ought to rescue me from whom exactly? 
Mr. Anderson, Trevor stepped forward, taking a knee next to him. We're from the Alpha Syndicate. You can call me Trevor. Your estate contacted my team and me to bring you back safe and sound. Safe, at least, Eric muttered. Trevor shot back a shut-the-fuck-up glare. As I was saying, we were also told to bring a relic of some kind, some sort of coin. Ah, yes, yes, the coin. The holy lens of the Nile God. The jewel of Fiam. Tosses the lot of my employ, but they are correct. Indeed, Trevor said, standing back as the archaeologist jumped spryly to his feet. May I ask what's so special about this piece? Ask, ask! Rohair crossed over to Trevor in two quick steps. I heard the sound of a safety being switched and looked to see Paige raising her rifle from the darkness. The weapon's muzzle pointed at Anderson. My god, man. I'd be insulted if you didn't. He laughed heartily and put a hand on Trevor's shoulder. Please, come. Uh, this way. I breathed an audible sigh of relief as the safety clicked again and the muzzle disappeared back into the darkness. This... Anderson said as we crowded around a torch underneath the massive stone monster. Is the coin of Sobek. He opened his hand to reveal a tiny circular glass disc half full of a deep purple liquid. That's not a coin, though, I muttered to Paige, who nudged me to shut up. Sobek was a god, you see, said to be born from these very lands. He was a god of co-creation. The Lord of the Waters, and a defender of balance, allying with the forces of order and chaos. Or, so the story goes. He clasped his hands back around the piece. He was worshipped for centuries. They would even mummify crocodiles with the pharaohs in hopes of protecting them in the afterlife. That's all well and good, sir, Trevor said, eyeing him carefully. But what does that have to do with this place? Ah, but that's just what I said, yes? We all looked at each other, confused. At least I did say that, right? I'm not thinking what I'm saying, or saying what I'm thinking again? It's a lot easier to do the latter, don't you think? Sir, Trevor said a little louder. Where are we? The man stood there for a second longer. He touched his fingertips together, muttering to himself. Rohair! I don't know! Anderson yelled back. Both their voices reverberated off the walls of the stone tomb. He gave a sigh and placed a hand on his head, rubbing his temples with his finger and thumb. I don't know. He walked back to the table stacking his books. Not one word. Not one word of this temple anywhere in history. This place isn't even on a map. A hiker simply stumbled upon it, taking a trek through the park. We slowly made our way over silently as he continued to explain. The, the only thing I can figure out is the tale of the coin. Now to find it, he sounded a bit frantic as he flipped through the dusty tomes, finally settling on a page written in ancient Egyptian. The text was translated on a post-it note on the next page. Wade reached and took the book, reading aloud to the rest of us. And rejoice, he who drinks the dark waters. Your cup shall fill and will be filled for all time. Take to task your prayers to the son of Nyeth. Allow his will to flow through your blood like the Nile of the Old Kingdom. Rejoice, dear brothers, in the union of your mortal flesh to that of the Lord of the Waters. Rejoice in his dark sea. Allow his path from the underworld to join your path to dreams. Rejoice, dear brothers, and heed our call of brotherhood. Heed the call of the Dark River God. So, the coin is filled with a never-ending drinking water supply? Page asked skeptically. Either that or lizard steroids, Eric threw in. Both great ideas, 
Anderson said in a much calmer tone. As far as I can surmise, this place was a secret temple to Sobek. As to why here, well, as you heard, they believe this to be the entrance to his world. The underworld, to be exact. That would explain the whole dark god bit, I said. I gripped my rifle a little bit firmer. Regardless of what it is, Trevor said, breaking me from my thoughts, I don't want to spend any longer in this place than I have to. Get your shit, sir, and keep a tight hold on the relic. We're leaving. Yeah, about that, boss, Eric said. Hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we can't go anywhere till the storm outside lets up. Nearly swept the big man and me away. Of course, there's a storm. All right, new plan. Let's make our way back to the entrance. We'll survey the scene and decide what to do next. Oh, if you require guidance, I can make a great guide to the cave mouth. Let me find my spectacles, please. Sir, they're on your face, Paige said in exasperation. Oh, yes, I see. Anderson pulled off his glasses and rubbed the smudges off. Kid, you're on point. Get us out of here. Trevor rubbed his temples. With a nod, I took to the task. The way back was a bit more manageable the second time. I didn't mind the journey as long as it got me out of there. I heard the storm before I saw it. The rushing wind from the dunes sounded like I was behind a plane getting ready for takeoff. I felt the sand grate on my teeth and sting my nose as I felt that familiar crunch beneath my feet. On top of that, the torchlight was almost completely swallowed by that dull, dark brown shade. Just my fucking luck. Well, shit. We will be here a bit longer than expected, Trevor exclaimed, seeing the thick wall of swirling sand surrounding our exit. Told you, boss, Eric said, defeated. Nothing we can do but let it pass. I guess so. Wade! Break out the camping gear. We're gonna ride it out as comfortably as we can. On it! Wade's voice echoed from the back as he sat his pack down and began rummaging through it. He pulled out the contents. Two tents, a hot plate, a small mess kit with a cooking pot, and ten soup cans. Check your bag, kid. Headquarters should have issued a field kit in case of emergencies like this. Inside, I found a mess kit similar to Wade's packed with canned stew, a small first aid kit, some spare ammunition, a sleeping bag, and a few flares. Pretty soon, we had a nice little setup. We used rocks for makeshift chairs while Trevor made a pot of soup for us. All the creature comforts, save for heat and water and not being trapped in a creepy abandoned temple. We'll work in shifts, Trevor said after finishing his bowl. Four hour post till the morning. The storm shouldn't last more than a few hours, but at the very least, it'll give you all some rest. Plus, with the sun blacked out by the sand, you can get some shut eye if we need to move in the night. I know we haven't seen anything abnormal yet. Well, abnormal for us, at least. Nevertheless, I need you all on top of shit. The fact we haven't seen anything is more unsettling than the norm. Are you forgetting the giant stone lizard and endless ocean covered in blackness and evil? Eric said, reaching for a second helping. N not evil per se. When you think about it, what is the modern religion if not successful c c cults? True, but I don't think I'm going to a creepy ass cave for a Baptist revival, Eric retorted, giving Trevor a very non-discreet eye roll. We all tried to stifle our laughter before Trevor cleared his throat. Congrats, Eric. You pulled the first watch. Paige will take second, followed by myself, the kid, and Wade will be our early bird. Works for me, I said, scarfing down the rest of the food. I better hit the sack. Trevor nodded. We all should. Try to rest as much as you can. We'll be out of here faster than you can say Cairo. Cairo... Eric called out. Say it slower, Paige yelled back. Mr. Anderson, feel free to try to rest by us if it makes you feel better. We'll wake you if we need to. Otherwise, we'll see you in the morning. 
As you say, my dear. Hopefully, together, the, the dreams won't be such an issue. Right. You and your group were having trouble sleeping. I almost forgot. The, the same dream every time. I found myself swimming. A pool of black water with no land in sight. Suddenly, mighty jaws sprang up and devoured me, tearing and rending my flesh from my body, dragging me down under the, the depths. The last thing I saw before waking were two red eyes the size of houses, glaring at me. Well, Paige said, sounding a bit unsettled, that sounds like a lovely image to see before bed. Indeed. Perhaps the farther away I am, the, the lesser the severity will be. Let's hope so, sir, Trevor said. He crawled onto a bare spot on the floor, pulling his pack as a pillow behind his head. I'd hate to have you go from slumbering to the unconscious, but if you have an episode and put my team in danger, I won't think twice about helping you go back to sleep. Y yes, of course. Anderson said. Again, he touched his fingertips, looking at the ground as he placed his back to the wall next to me. The man looked like a kid who'd broken a window and waited for punishment. I felt a little bad for the guy. It wasn't too long before he and the rest of the team were out. I'm not sure when it was when I finally drifted off. With the hard floor and ever-blowing wind, I thought I never would. Somehow, I managed. I must have been sleeping lighter than I thought, seeing that it was seemingly for no reason when I woke up. I sat up, rubbing my eyes to adjust to the darkness. The storm must have finally stopped since I could feel myself think again. No more rushing wind or sand particles slapped my face. Something else had replaced it, though. A low, buzzing ring crept up my spine and settled behind my eardrums, like when you stop listening to something loud. It was an itch I couldn't scratch no matter how much I tugged at my ears. I think it got louder, to be honest. My eyes finally adjusted, moving to the torchlight that illuminated our little camp. Trevor was sitting on a rock with his back to me. He was rigid and on edge. Kid, do not make a sound, do not panic, and listen to me very carefully. With those words, my body went on high alert. My hands stiffened around the grip of my rifle. The ringing seemed to turn up a notch. All the ambient sounds faded away so that I could barely hear Trevor's voice. Something's not right. I want you to slowly, very slowly, inch towards the cave mouth. Look outside and tell me what you see. My legs worked, whether it was the comfort of knowing Trevor was there or sheer muscle memory. I carefully tiptoed off to the mouth of the cave. Making my way, I realized something else. Every torch was out. Not just the ones at the mouth during the storm, but everywhere, even heading back inside. The only illumination came from Trevor's lighter and the light outside. Wait a second. Where was the fucking moon? Where were the stars? There was nothing there. I don't mean that it was so overcast that the moon was blocked. I mean there was nothing. Just a deep purple backdrop that seemed... Well, it seemed to move. It vibrated and twisted, casting a damp glow on the sand in front of us. The sand. The ever-growing range of dunes seemed to go on endlessly. Sand, rocks, and dust, but no trucks. There were no tarps, no trash. Hell, there weren't even footprints or tracks in any direction. And the sand... It wasn't brown. It was pitch black, like God grated coal from the heavens, a massive ocean of black as far as the eye could see. I don't think we're in Egypt anymore, kid, 
Trevor said a few feet behind me. It was hard to hear him. It was hard to hear anything. The ringing increased enough to make my knees shake. I kept my balance and tried to concentrate. Where? I don't know. I can't even remember when the storm stopped. It was there when I took it from Paige, and then it just stopped. Like that. He snapped his fingers. I could feel myself starting to hyperventilate. I lost my sense. I thought I might lose my dinner. I didn't know what to say. Easy, kid. We're not where we were, but we're alive. I woke the team. Let's get a plan. His voice cut out. The ringing wouldn't let me hear. It seeped into my brain, and I could feel my skull vibrate. I dropped to my knees, clutching my head in my hands, and screamed. Even though I couldn't hear it, I felt my mouth contort, jaw popping and vocal cords shaking. Eventually, I heard something else. It wasn't the ambience. It wasn't Trevor or the others shaking me, their mouths yelling but silent. It was something deep and primordial, guttural and angry. A voice that traveled from the very earth up my body, where I felt it grip my soul and work my mouth like I was a puppet. I heard it in my mind as the others heard it from me. Return it! My body trembled. The air left me. I felt violated and worked over, but at least the ringing had stopped. I looked up at them. The looks on their faces flashed from fear to concern, settling on Trevor's solemn grimace. Kid, Marcus, can you hear me? I looked at him and nodded. Stand up, he said, reaching a hand out and pulling me up. I felt a hand on my back and looked to see Paige, still eyeing me with concern. She had the eyes of a mother, someone who didn't want to see you hurt, who wanted to bear the weight of your pain. I hadn't seen that side of her before. Trevor's voice snapped us both back to the situation. Look guys, I don't know what's going on. I don't know who took the lights out or decided to play ventriloquist with a kid. All I know is we're here, and whether it's a ghost or a god throwing a bitch fit, we have to figure out a way to get the fuck out of Dodge. Now look alive. We don't know what's out there. A gunshot rang out, the sound that comes from a high-powered rifle. Eric was kneeling and firing out into the sand. I think I have a pretty good idea, boss, he shouted. We all turned to see what he was talking about. The sand was moving. The black crystals flew away like the wake from a boat. Something was swimming underneath. Something massive. And it was heading right for us. Make a kill zone! Eric, keep peppering the waves and lead your shots! Paige, Marcus, find cover and alternate bursts! Wade, break open the tripod and put the pig on cyclic! Let's go! We all flew into action. Eric's rifle barked again as he aimed in. Wade's machine gun barrel glowed as he held the trigger down, his tracer rounds lighting up the night. It was so disorienting, everything was happening so fast, but Paige grabbed me and slammed me against a nearby wall. She let a burst of rounds fly while Trevor mirrored us on the far side, but the thing kept coming. It was nearing us, strafing side to side, almost surfing the dunes. It was fast. Paige and I alternated every other burst, but if the firepower we were throwing at it didn't slow it down, what were we going to do when it decided to pop out? Paige, now! Trevor shouted. Paige stepped forward and opened the bottom of her rifle, loading a grenade. With the trigger's pull, the grenade flew out lighting the sand in front of us on fire. Please kill this fucking thing. Please kill it, I thought. I prayed to God, to anyone with the power to listen. My heart sank lower than I thought it could as the creature plowed right through, extinguishing the flames in its wake. 
It was almost here, and it was getting faster. The sounds of a rifle stopped, ringing out among the volley of lead. Eric stood and backpedaled quickly, trying to get his mag out. Trevor, I'm dry! I gotta... That's all he got out. Then, a large black mouth filled with gargantuan teeth opened up from underneath him and ripped him in two. The beast dove out of the sand to stand on its back legs. It was as tall as a bus and twice as wide. Its body was coated a deep black that gave off an unnatural glow, its red eyes widening in glee. It was a giant black crocodile. Its gaping maw snapped down on Eric again, spraying chunks of bone and viscera across the cave floor. His arm still dangled from the beast's tooth. I heard Wade yell, turning his weapon on the croc and firing again. In one swift motion, the creature dipped down and reached the man in the blink of an eye. The firing stopped as it picked Wade up with its massive hands and grabbed Wade by both sides. Then it pulled. Wade popped like a cork. His intestines spilled from him to the floor as he screamed, a scream of immeasurable pain mixed with fear and the truth of certain death. His cries were drowned out as the creature spoke, projecting his voice to all of us. Return that which you stole! The beast hurled Wade's body against the wall with a meaty thwack, painting it with blood. More! There's more! Page screamed out. The entire desert, this ocean of blackness, and the sands of hell were churning. More waves came. More creatures were coming to us. I heard the scream of the one person I couldn't bear to hear. I looked over to see the creature had grabbed onto Trevor and was hanging him upside down, lowering him to its throat. Trevor was yelling. He emptied his magazine into the creature. It was unfazed, like he was shooting it with a spitball. Yet nothing seemed to work. Trev! Paige screamed out as she rushed to save him. It was too late. The creature's jaws came down again, crushing Trevor's head like a grape. She stopped screaming. She stopped running. She turned. She looked at me with the same mother-like eyes, now filled with tears. Then a second beast slammed into her, turning her body into a pink mist. They were dead. Everyone was dead. Trevor, Eric, Wade, Paige. I backed up against the wall. I could do nothing but stand there and watch as my team was turned into a grinder. Another beast landed in front of me, standing back as it towered above me. I didn't want to die like this. Like them. I grabbed my pistol. I raised it and pointed it to my head. I heard the voice again. Return the waters of the river, God! I fired. I sprang awake with a scream. Awake? Not dead. Not in heaven. Still in this brown shithole on Earth. This brown, well-lit shithole with a sandstorm roaring outside. Had this all been a dream? I looked around and my suspicions were confirmed, as everyone was still out. But they were in one piece and breathing. They also looked to be having the worst dreams of their lives. Everyone was twitching and spasming, their eyes moving rapidly under their eyelids. I saw Eric knocked out against the wall. We must have never made it out of the first watch. Fuck it. I didn't care. I knew what I needed to do. I steeled myself as I opened my pack and grabbed my flares. 
Anderson was only a few feet away. Ironically, he was the only one who seemed to sleep soundly, snoring like a sawmill with the coin laying plainly on his chest, its once dark waters now glowing a deep blood red color. I grabbed the coin. I took it and ran back inside. The torches here were still lit, so I didn't have to use the flares yet. I quickly found myself on the ramp leading into the sanctum. Where the other torches had stayed lit, the room itself had snuffed any light that was there when we left. I lit one of my flares and made a break for the table. The second I entered, I felt watched. A million eyes watched me all staring in delight as I sprinted and stood on the table. I must have nearly tripped twice in trying to get there. My hand clasped at the coin as I wrenched it from my pocket and placed it back in the stone croc's mouth. But it wasn't stone. It didn't feel like stone. It felt warm and wet. I felt a tongue that curled and gently lifted the coin from my fingertips. I heard that voice chill my veins again, not in my head, but in my ear, right next to me. Good boy. My flare went out. I stumbled and crawled away, trying to orient myself in the dark. That was when I heard the laughter. The deep, guttural, sickly laughter of a hellish crowd erupted from the sea below, seeping up through the walls and burrowing into my brain. I didn't think as I grabbed another flare, stood up, and ran to the exit, trying not to shit myself. I tried not to pay attention to the shadows on the walls. Every time I looked at them, they smiled a toothy Cheshire grin. Wake up! I yelled at the top of my lungs. I didn't hear the howling wind anymore, didn't taste the sand. Reaching the entrance, I saw the storm was gone and the skies were clear. The normal sky. I screamed again as Trevor's body shot up, pointing a pistol around. What is it, kid? What's going on? He said through half-closed eyes. Look, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but where is it? Anderson's cries cut me off. Where is the coin? He was searching everywhere, pulling packs open and tearing at his pockets. Trevor looked at me with a raised eyebrow. Kid, what did you do? I just saved our asses. Now can we please leave? N not with without the coin, you ingrate. Anderson was in my face now. His cheeks flushed with rage as he poked my chest. I have spent half my life chasing a find like this. No mercenary is going to fuck. He couldn't finish. My fist connected with his jaw and hit his snooze button. Marcus, what the hell is going on? I heard Paige from behind me. Uh, yeah, rookie, what the fuck? Eric said with a yawn. I grabbed my hair and pulled, letting out a yell of frustration. Halfway through, I felt Trevor grab my wrist. Not hard, but hard enough to tell me to look at him. His eyes met mine, and he understood. With a nod, he turned. Pack up, team. Let's get the hell out of here. Storm's over. Should be smooth riding back home. All protests stopped at once. Everyone looked at me then at each other. They quickly began to pack up. Within minutes, we sped away from the cave and back to civilization. So, that's it? James Silva, the head of Syndicate HR, sat before me, scribbling his notes down on a piece of yellow office paper. He was a tall, middle-aged guy. His once black hair, now streaked with some silver, was slicked back with a shitload of pomade and, I'm sure, every other product under the sun. The bright blue suit and shiny gold Rolex completed his used car salesman getup. Yes, sir, that's it. 
We made it to transport, exfilled to London, then landed here three days ago. We'd been given a couple of days to rest after getting back. A few hours ago, I'd gotten a call that I needed to come in for a performance evaluation. Before I knew it, a black SUV with tinted windows pulled up in front of my apartment building, and I was strongly encouraged to go for a ride. Thank you, Mr. Kent. Sir, can I ask why I'm here? Of course you can, Mr. Kent. Silva flashed a toothy grin and sat his paper on the table, leaning forward to give me his full attention. 50% of a job well done is 100% failure, in management's opinion. We don't have time for half-assed contracts in our line of work. Now, since you are new to the company, certain faults are understandable. So don't worry, you still have employment with us. He paused briefly, like he wanted to ensure I fully understood what he was saying. 50%? I scoffed. We got Anderson out safe. Yes, you did, Mr. Kent. But you also just admitted to returning the coin, the other half of the job. But I... He waved his hand with a smile. Nice corporate way of saying, shut the fuck up. While management is frustrated, we understand that certain mishaps will happen during a training period. That, coupled with your performance review from your supervisor who saw you in a more, shall we say, favorable light. My supervisor? That would be me, kid. Trevor's voice came behind me as the door opened, bringing some natural light into this dingy fluorescent shithole. You done with him, Silva? Got a briefing in five. Hmm. Silva looked over all his notes again. Everything here is in order. I'll update contract number 26043 accordingly. He turned to me. You're free to go, Mr. Kent. We left in a hurry, power walking through the corridors and cubicles. I looked over to see Trevor light a cigarette as we passed the last row of office drones to the door at the back of the complex. Thanks, man. For what, kid? He blew a plume of smoke out and turned to look at me. Well, for saving my ass with that report. He gave out a laugh and shook his head. Kid, you saved all our asses back in Egypt. Those dreams. What I saw, what we all saw, I wouldn't have woken up. Least I can do. You trusted my judgment. I couldn't help but crack a smile. Didn't Paige tell you? The golden rule, kid. Always trust your team. These guys... He pointed to the complex. They find people like us. People that don't have anyone. Loners, drifters, runaways. You get the picture. They put a gun in our hands and use us to turn a profit. What family do we have if not the ones beside us when the shit hits the fan? I know you trust me. I know everyone in the team does. I also need to trust you all as well. I nodded as my smile widened. Now, he said, before taking a long pull and puffing the cigarette down to the filter. Get your game face on, kid. Time to go to work. Valen Forest, Derbyshire, 1984. I sat in the driver's seat of my aging Ford Granada and listened to the rain pound relentlessly on the car's metal roof, a sound I had always found strangely soothing. Once the torrent subsided, I looked outside to watch late afternoon mists coil and dance across the undulating surface of the lake, the rocky shore of which provided access to the cottage I would be renting for the next few weeks. Beyond the lake stood Valen Forest, where towering fir trees loomed like foreboding sentinels that swayed hypnotically in the stiff October breeze. The purpose of this solo trip was a matter of healing. I had recently finalized my divorce from my wife, Elizabeth. The separation was her idea, although there had been no great transgressions on my part. 
Whilst we had been steadily drifting apart for some time, the real catalyst had been the sudden death of our nine-month-old daughter, Charlotte, nearly two years previously. The reason given on her death certificate was SIDS, or Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. She had simply ceased breathing in her sleep. There were no warning signs to speak of and no illness to foreshadow her demise. I had awoken one night to Elizabeth screaming in Charlotte's room. When I rushed to see what the commotion was about, my mind still hazy from bourbon and sleeping pills, I found Elizabeth hysterical and cradling Charlotte's limp body in her arms. Her face was a bluish gray, her eyes barren, fingers ice cold when I held them to my cheek, devoid of the warmth normally bestowed by life. The months that followed were a nightmare for both of us. Mostly, I was on autopilot, unable to allow myself to grieve in a normal and healthy way. As a usually robust man of six feet and two hundred pounds, I quickly lost weight to the point of becoming skeletal. My complexion grew pallid, whilst my black hair and beard succumbed to premature grayness, the toll of my grief visible for all to see, even if I couldn't express it directly. Elizabeth was the direct opposite, and yielded to her anguish so completely that it consumed her. In truth, I was jealous of her ability to feel, whilst on some level, I must also admit that I resented what felt like gratuitous wallowing. I just felt a sickening emptiness every time I thought of that night and those cold, lifeless fingers against my cheek, her hand small and fragile, yet heavy with the burden of loss. Elizabeth eventually returned to some semblance of normality, working through her grief to attain a point of reluctant acceptance. I dragged myself out of the car and inhaled crisp autumn air into my lungs to clear my head. Many of the trees surrounding the lake were vibrant with rusted hues of red, brown, and gold, which stood in contrast to the evergreens of Valen Forest itself. Even from this distance, I could hear the noise of the wind as it coursed through the twisted and gnarled limbs of the woodland's inhabitants, the dense canopy shifting under strain, almost breathing as though the forest itself was a vast living entity. I turned to regard the cottage behind me, a small single-story house with weathered cream exterior walls and a dark slate roof that looked like it needed repairs in several places. I quickly locked the car, a habit of inner-city living that had no meaning in a place like this, and made my way up the cottage's gravel path. I approached the front door with its cracked black paint and fumbled for the keys the agent had given me. They were as old and corroded as the cottage itself. A paper sticker bore my name, Sean McGuire, with the collection date in Blue Bureau that was starting to streak with the rain. When I unlocked the door, it swung open lethargically on rusted hinges to reveal a dim and shadowed room beyond. The air smelled heavy and damp. I hadn't expected luxury by any means, the pictures in the brochure had prepared me for a back-to-basics lifestyle, but I still felt a sense of unease that this would be home for a while. I dragged myself and my bags inside and searched for the light switch, the single bulb adorned by a dated beige lampshade casting a subdued light. The room itself was a simple affair. A taupe sofa and chair were arranged around an old-fashioned coffee table. The heavy chimney stack contained a large black iron grate in which logs had been arranged in a triangle. A pine TV stand was placed in the corner, upon which sat a large television with a huge bulbous back. None of the furniture matched. A narrow hallway led to the bedroom, bathroom, and kitchen. The bedroom and bathroom were generously sized but the kitchen was small and awkward to maneuver around, but was sufficient for one. 
It was late afternoon by the time I had unpacked and got myself settled. I lit the log fire to take the chill off the air and warmed up some pre-prepared food in the small gas oven that had yellowed with age. I also put on the TV for sound, to create a vague sense of company for myself. With the fire glowing and a few candles lit, the cottage was almost starting to feel cozy. After my meal, I stepped outside to get a feel for the surrounding area. It was dusk now, a dark purple sky tinged with wispy veins of yellow and amber. I walked down the path and made my way to the water's edge. My feet crunched satisfyingly on the rocks that formed its shoreline, and I delighted at my breath being visible in the frigid dusk air. This had always been my favorite time of year, when summer succumbed to the onset of autumn and altogether fresher conditions. The lake was vast, with still waters that reflected the hues of the sky above in a vivid and mesmerizing fashion. About the lake's perimeter were lights from the windows of cottages and farmsteads sporadically scattered around its border. These were signs of life, yet sufficiently distant to still give me that sense of isolation I craved. I will admit, however, that it was also comforting to know I wasn't completely alone out here. City people tend to romanticize rural solitude in a way that rarely accords with reality. The first few days were spent lazily unpacking my belongings and acclimatizing to the solitude of this place with occasional walks by the lake during the day and reading in front of the roaring log fire in the evening. Eventually, I felt courageous enough to explore Valen Forest itself. On the day of my planned hike, I set my alarm for 5.30 a.m., so I would have plenty of time to explore the woodland before dusk set in. I ate breakfast with strong black coffee and prepared for my excursion. I pulled on my hiking gear, including my thick mustard jumper, olive walking trousers, and padded orange jacket and filled a small rucksack with supplies. I chose to head north, away from the more populated areas, and soon came to a point where the lake narrowed into a ravine. A wooden bridge facilitated access to the other side and the sprawling forest beyond. The bridge itself was a modern affair of distinctly Nordic architecture. Upon reaching the path on the other side, I paused to survey my surroundings and soak up the peculiar atmosphere of this place. I wanted to explore the depths of this majestic forest landscape. Still, trepidation had instantly seized me, encroaching anxiety that began in the pit of my stomach to seep outwards towards my extremities causing my fingers and lips to tremble discernibly. I cursed myself for my sudden infirmity. I was not inherently anxious, so why did I suddenly apprehend such a great fear of this place? Pushing my unease aside, I followed the path that led from the bridge to make a mental note of the general direction in which to return. The thick forest allowed for little light and a tangible gloom seemed to hang in the very air of this place. The path that I followed appeared well-trodden, and I assumed it to be a popular hiking route in the summer months. Occasionally, the landscape would thin out and relinquish scenery of such outstanding beauty that I began to develop a real sense of awe for Valen Forest. I would often stop to marvel at some sight or sound, the churning of a stream as waterfowl glided across its surface, or the sound of a distant heron or raven. I must have walked around an hour before the forest dispersed into a large clearing. I intended to rest, but something strange caught my eye, roughly ten meters from where I sat, and I edged forward cautiously to get a better look. A small stone circle had been arranged on an even and slightly elevated patch of ground. Above its perimeter were five severed fox heads, their glassy and lifeless eyes staring back at me as the breeze gently touched their matted fur. At the center of the circle were the ashen remnants of a fire. 
The closer I got, the more I could smell the burned incense of jasmine, frankincense, and patchouli. It was as though this obscene display had been the focal point of some bizarre ritual, and I assumed it was meant to serve as an altar. But to what purpose? Each of the heads had a substance smeared upon their brow, as if consecrated by a priest on Ash Wednesday. It was as though something sinister clung to the very air of this place. It was both invisible yet strangely tangible, and seemed to permeate my being to the point that I immediately felt infected by it. I quickly took a step back and tried to steady my breathing as my mind raced, desperately trying to rationalize the situation's absurdity. It was then that I heard the sound of something familiar, and instantly, my stomach lurched with a new terror. From the area behind the trees directly in front of me, I heard her voice for the first time in years. The sound of my baby daughter's cries. It was unmistakable, the sound particular to Charlotte, an urgent cry that usually meant that she needed to be fed or consoled. I had the sudden overwhelming urge to run towards the sound, but remained rooted to the spot, completely transfixed. The sound came again, this time sharper and more abrupt, as though she had suddenly been afflicted with pain. Although I knew it could not possibly be her, I still raised my feet slowly and moved towards the sound. When the scream of pain came again, my body was filled with a sudden impetus, not to run to the perceived source, to console my infant daughter, but to turn and flee from whatever sinister being was mimicking her and cruelly mocking my grief. I charged through the woods in the direction I had come, thankful that most of it was downhill, fear and adrenaline propelling me forward. Relief finally came as I exited the forest to collapse, exhausted, against the bridge rail, my heart pounding and my lungs on fire from the frenetic exertion. Before standing, I heard Charlotte's cries again, from deep within the forest. I immediately pulled myself to my feet and pushed onward towards the cottage. Upon my return, I raced into the kitchen and tore off my clothes, throwing them into the washing machine before heading straight for the bathroom and plunging into the shower, as though trying to remove the stain of that place. I spent the rest of the evening in a sullen state, as I dwelled relentlessly upon the sound of Charlotte's cries, old wounds afresh within my psyche. I tried everything to rationalize my experience. Could it have been a hallucination induced by the anxiety of that place? Was it a lack of sleep and food that led my mind to perceive things that were not really there? Could the cry have been the sound of an animal? There must be a rational explanation. I had sought rural isolation to find a much-needed sense of peace and freedom only to find myself drawn into a connection with forces beyond my comprehension. Either that or my mind had finally failed me to the extent that I was actually hearing my dead infant daughter cry out from the forest. Turning in for the night, I found sleep elusive, but finally drifted into slumber sometime around midnight. I jolted violently awake, sucking in air as though I had been struggling to breathe in my sleep. The bedside clock told me it was 3 a.m. Climbing from my bed, I walked from the bedroom to the living room and opened the front door, stepping outside to draw fresh air into my lungs. Above me churned a vast night sky in ominous hues of black, whilst the wind coursed about me like a choir of unfettered whispers. I walked the short distance to the shore of the lake as I wanted to look at the forest again, where I had witnessed such strange events only hours earlier. A sharp crescent moon cast a narrow, shimmering path of light 
that stretched from the opposite side of the lake to where I stood, silently observing as the light flitted across the water's surface. I turned to survey my immediate surroundings, the veiled shadow meadows on either side of the cottage, and the forest entrance further up the gravel path to the north. Then, something on the trail drew my attention, and I narrowed my eyes to try and see more clearly. A shadowy, humanoid form stood near the base of a tree on the path I had used to return home. Whilst the form was nebulous and difficult to clearly discern, its outline was unmistakably that of a female. Was it a natural formation or an actual person? My heart leapt in a painful spasm that momentarily stole my breath as the figure moved to confirm my fear that I was not alone out here. As she approached, I watched the figure gain clarity as though drawing power from the moon itself. From her featureless black face, two shining golden eyes appeared. Her body was solid yet enshrouded by a vaporous mist, like black liquid nitrogen that billowed down to her feet and then outwards to gradually dissipate in the ether. Her long, flowing garments belonged to another time. Then, the sound of Charlotte's cries came again, as the apparition lowered her arms, hands disappearing into her vestments, to remove something pale and heavy. My stomach churned with disgust as the figure held the writhing body of my baby daughter aloft, suspended in the air by one hand that was clenched tightly around her throat, blood drawn and weeping where long fingernails had found vicious purchase. Her naked body dangled and flailed against the assault as she screamed in pain, her eyes turning towards me pleadingly her cries straining under the vice-like grip on her supple throat. I turned and fled to the sanctuary of the cottage, slamming the door behind me and flicking on the light, shaking hands clumsily securing the bolts. My legs buckled beneath me as I turned and frantically clawed my way across the floor to prop myself upright against the front of the sofa, eyes never leaving the door as the room was suddenly plunged into momentary silence. My respite was to be short-lived. Whilst the sound of Charlotte's cries had slowly receded to nothingness, I suddenly became aware of the sound of scratching at the door. Then Charlotte's cries started again as more voices came, a crescendo of layered whispers wherein individual voices were impossible to discern. Fingers began to tap on all of the windows at once, as though a group of people had surrounded the house. Anger boiled in my blood, and I summoned the strength to pick up the coffee table and throw it at the door, quickly falling to my hands and knees again with the exertion. Leave me the fuck alone! I bellowed the words a struggle to form in my traumatized state. Suddenly, all the noises abated, and the silence was deafening, the atmosphere in the room suddenly thick with static and tension as the hairs on my body began to rise. From the corner came a new voice, one that was actually inside the house. My boy, open the door, it pleaded. I need to see you, please, Sean. It is my mother's voice, with its unmistakable heavy Irish accent. My mother passed away over a decade ago. Her voice hits me like a truck, but I know it is not her. I fled to the bedroom, slamming the door behind me and hearing the sound of laughter behind me as I did so. The sound of my mother's laughter, yet somehow different, inhuman almost, and tinged with cruelty and malice. No more sounds came that night, and I eventually pushed the bed up against the door and collapsed on it to sleep for a few precious hours. I awoke exhausted to the morning light filtering through the garish golden curtains of the cottage bedroom window. 
Feeling nauseous from fatigue, I pushed myself off the bed and dragged it back across the room. I found the cottage to be just as I had left it the previous night. I quickly straightened up the place and opened the window to allow some fresh air in despite the cold, as though it would somehow help cleanse the room of last night's events. The rest of the day was spent in a state of gnawing anxiety as I tried to rationalize my experience. Could it have been the result of sleepwalking, a waking dream? Or could it be that in such a secluded and isolated location, without the distractions of city living, the true extent of my mental decline was becoming apparent? There was no denying that there was something strange about this area. Valen Forest had a rich history of witchcraft, and was the home to the most notorious witch in British history, an unashamed demon worshipper executed in the region for the most unbelievable crimes. Whilst I have never been a believer in such things, it cannot be denied that they can exert an enormous psychological effect on people, particularly those in a vulnerable state. I questioned whether this could have influenced the visions I had experienced. I abandoned all plans of exploration that day and instead hung around the cottage drinking coffee and trying to occupy my mind. I retired early to bed at 9pm and quickly succumbed to sleep. My mind was assailed by vivid nightmares, crying infants and desolate places, dark foreboding landscapes wherein skinless beings lurked in shadow yet watched with glowing eyes, their chattering teeth like the stridulation of a cricket swarm. I awoke suddenly with a violent spasm that snapped my mind into waking reality, yet I found that my body was frozen. My limbs were cold and heavy as though paralyzed, whilst saliva seeped from the corner of my mouth. It was then that I saw a dark shadow in the corner of the bedroom, like a nebulous column of black smoke that caused the air around it to distort. A noise, like a low hum or vibration, radiated from that part of the room. Her face appeared again from the black miasma, and my heart began to thunder at the sight of two radiant eye slits that opened to regard me with contempt, like a lion stalking its prey. Her form shambled forward awkwardly, as though in stop motion, as a multitude of voices came, of dying lambs and crying babies, of breaking bones and chattering teeth. I watched on helplessly as the figure loomed above me, her form slowly twisting into shape like a crooked and gnarled tree. A large hand with spindly fingers veiled my face, and I was instantly lost to the darkness. Oblivion. I awoke once more to the intrusion of dawn, and my entire body ached as I shifted myself into an upright position. No dreams lingered. No dark recollections of my time in the void. Just the vague impression of a woman's voice that echoed in my mind. I am Besleth, the Eater of Light. My mind was firm. I must escape from this place. I quickly grabbed my belongings, shoved them into my suitcases, and threw everything haphazardly into the boot of my car. Crawling into the driver's seat, I tried the ignition without even bothering to secure my seatbelt. Nothing. I tried again. Dead. Exasperated, I slammed my fist on the steering wheel and climbed back out to look inside the engine bay. I know nothing about cars, but everything seemed to be in order, with no obvious burn marks or damage. Defeated and cursing, I slammed the hood and headed for the nearest town. Wellsbrook is a typically English rural village wherein the locals are all intimately familiar with each other's lives and possess a subtle hostility towards outsiders. I located the local shop, 
with its aged timber windows, crisp net curtains, and a chalkboard outside indicating that you could get fresh eggs, bread, and milk daily. Approaching the counter, I found a heavy-set ginger-haired gentleman with a full beard hunched over the counter, reading a newspaper that was set between two chunky and freckled forearms. He looked up suddenly when my presence snapped him out of his concentration. His eyes were a pale blue, yet possessed a hardness not befitting a shopkeeper. His forearm tattoos confirmed my suspicion. Ex-military. The rural shop in such an isolated location was probably the result of his own yearning for a quieter, more subdued existence. I hoped he was having more success than I was. Good morning, I said, trying my best to sound friendly. Morning, came the gruff reply as he lumbered into an upright position. He was a lot taller than I had first reckoned, and would not look out of place working the doors in a rough East London nightclub. Feeling the need to purchase something, I picked up a bottle of water and a local newspaper from the stack, knowing I would never actually read it. Just these, please, I said awkwardly, placing them on the counter. That'll be forty pence. I quickly handed over the money. Staying local, are you? Yes, I'm renting a cottage near the lake about two miles up the road. Oh, of course, yeah. The old Evans place. His demeanor softening just a little. Saw you there yesterday morning when I was out making deliveries. The Evans passed away a few years back, and the daughter now lets the place out to tourists. She didn't want to live there, apparently. Getting a fancy job in the city is what I heard. Nice little place, though. He paused briefly. Listen, mate, just a word of advice, but do be careful if you head into the woods by yourself. Valen Forest is vast and can be a very disorienting place if you don't know it well. The last thing we locals need is to send out another party of volunteers to search for hikers who have gone and got themselves lost. Thanks, I'll bear that in mind, I replied. Is there a mechanic in town? I'm having an issue with my car. It won't start. Not here, mate, but there's one in the next town over, but that's nearly twenty miles away. Oh, I see. I sighed wearily. Do you have a number for them at all? Yeah, mate, just a second. He disappeared into the back room for a few minutes before emerging with a number scrawled on a post-it note. Here you go. There's a payphone on the other side of the village. You give him a call. He'll sort you out. Anyway, what's your name? He inquired. Sean. I'm Frank. I'm open most days if you need anything and can deliver too if needs be. Just let me know. I quickly said my goodbyes, located the overgrown payphone that looked as though it hadn't been used in years, and dialed the number on an ancient and corroded keypad. Hello? A voice answered, its timbre thin and crackly. Hi, is this the mechanic? It is, mate. How can I help? I'm having issues with my car. The engine appears dead. Won't turn over at all, and I'm trying to get home. I'm staying in a small cottage near the lake just outside Wellsbrook. The old Evans place, apparently, if that means anything to you. It does, mate. I can come tomorrow afternoon, if that's any use. Can you not come sooner? I'm actually rather keen to be on my way. Nah, sorry, mate. It'll be tomorrow afternoon at the earliest. Best I can do, sorry. Realizing I had little choice in the matter, I agreed to the time and made my way back to Frank's shop, picking up a bottle of Jim Beam to help me get through the night to come. On the journey home, I pondered my predicament. Had the events of the last few years, which started with Charlotte's death and culminated in my divorce from Elizabeth, really damaged my mind to such an extent? Was it possible that the degree of my mental decline had only really become apparent once I had isolated myself in such a rural area as this? A more immediate concern was how I would survive the night to come. 
that thing was bound to return to torment me again. When I arrived back at the cottage, I quickly ate and then prepared the place to leave for good the following morning. This would be the last night I would ever spend in this place. I would be walking home if the car could not be fixed, whatever it took. I then sat and drank straight from the bottle. I had drained half of it before long. Even so, the gnawing anxiety remained, so I kept drinking, until I succumbed to intoxication and exhaustion so completely that I staggered through to the bedroom and collapsed on the bed, the oblivion of sleep consuming me instantly, the sanctuary of nothingness. I awoke once more gasping for air, initially unsure of my surroundings until the reality of the past few days swarmed my mind. It was dark outside, and the hands of my watch, although difficult to discern in the gloom, told me it was 3 a.m. My mouth was bone dry, and nausea churned in my stomach. A subtle movement, like the flitting of a shadow, drew my attention to the foot of the bed, where she stood. A tall, black, twisted form, with a radiant yet penetrating gaze, a silent voyeur that had watched me sleep for a time undetermined. My senses swayed as she crept up my paralyzed body, Bezleth, the Eater of Light. She seized me with hands that were impossibly large for a woman and brutally strong, pushing my head down into the bed with horrifying force. Her mouth split open like a serrated laceration, a gaping maw of obsidian teeth. From her open mouth, a sound emerged, like the thunderous roar of a waterfall, and her body shook with the sheer violence of it. An icy cold seeped into the top of my skull as she poured her essence into me as though I were a vacant vessel to be filled. I lay motionless and powerless as her form began to fade, dissipating like cinders in the rain, until I found myself alone. The room plunged into a sudden stillness. Then. The voices began to emanate from within me, and I knew that I had finally succumbed to this malevolent being that dwells in the absence of light. It is dawn now, and the morning grows like an open wound in the veiled windows of the cottage. I resent its presence. It is intrusive, like a sordid scrutiny of a peeping tom and I find myself both fearing and dreading the light. I do not remember doing so, but I have positioned a chair in the center of the living room and clawed away the ceiling plaster to expose a heavy wooden beam. My hands still bleed profusely from the frantic efforts of this. The long wire from the ancient TV has been tied around the beam, and there is a wide, open noose at the other end that sways hypnotically in slow, circular motions as I continue to stare at it with an unwavering gaze from my position on the floor. Charlotte continues to cry for me, and many voices beckon me to the void. I am no longer afraid. Soon, I will be joining them. Let me tell you one thing first. When your folks tell you to choose your friends wisely, to make sure just how well you know them, listen to them. Clear skies, cool breeze, and the whole week spent hiking with my friends. What could go wrong? Who knows? It might just keep you out of shit like what happened to me. It was spring break, and we were all packed into my minivan for a big hiking trip we'd been planning for a couple weeks leading up. See, senior year college classes had put us through hell, so we collectively agreed we needed a break. Our plan 
is to hike all around Grenview Pines, go sightseeing, explore nature, and just admire the place. Mara, my girlfriend, said she wanted to go somewhere picturesque. Somewhere secluded, you know, like a place you'd think was only in a movie or something, she told me. After hours of scouring Google for places to stage this little getaway, we found this area. When I showed her a few of the snapshots they had listed for the area, she was ecstatic. Oh my god, babe, it's beautiful. We have to go there, please. Personally, I had to agree. The place was gorgeous, at least from what I saw in the photos. It reminded me of when I'd visited my grandparents' cabin in Chimney Rock. It looked like a quiet, peaceful place to just get away from everything and unwind. Exactly what I wanted. When looking for ideal hiking trails in Grenview Pines, I was met with a map with a list of at least five or six that wrapped around the mountain. Most of the various reviews and posts from others about the place seemed to correspond with this. Almost every one of them used phrases like picturesque, vibrant, quiet, and even a few that labeled the place as being straight out of an art gallery. My mind was made then, having also run the idea by the others, Kendrick, Todd, and Todd's girlfriend, Amanda, all of whom had more or less the same reaction about Grenview as Mara and me. The only one that wasn't big on the idea was Shauna. Isn't that where they used to hang people for witchcraft and shit? We looked at her, confused. Yeah, they used to hang women there for witchcraft. So? Todd asked. What does it matter? So, you don't think that's a little insensitive? She retorted. Shauna had a bit of a point there. She was an open Wiccan, spending most of her time outdoors in thickly wooded areas and even hosting online tarot or rune readings every weekend or so for extra cash. That was actually how me and Mara met her for the first time. Unfortunately, Todd was the opposite. His folks were deacons at the local church, and while they were all Baptists, in other words, not exactly the most uppity about that shit, or so I thought, they still weren't very fond of stuff like witchcraft. Because of this, we typically hung out with them separately. But this time, I wanted all of us to have fun together as a group. Todd rolled his eyes and remarked, What? Are you afraid you're going to burst into flames or something from being on holy ground? Maybe you'll hear your dead ancestors screaming, Save me, Satan, or some shit. Shauna wasn't amused. I could tell she was two seconds from kicking Todd's ass and flaking on the trip, so I stepped in. That's enough, Todd. Leave her alone. What? I'm just saying. She's being all prude and sensitive about it because she knows I'm right. Go fuck yourself, Todd. He mockingly said in a fake voice, Uh-oh, you hear that? She'll curse me. I'm so scared now. Ooh. I said knock it off, I shouted. He scoffed before throwing his hands up and storming off. I turned back to Shauna, whose face was a mix of anger and something else. Almost of some sort of paranoia. Hey, I said, putting my hand on her shoulder. Don't let him get to you. He's just an asshole sometimes. Yeah, sure, she said. Whatever, but seriously, that place is fucked up. My grandmother told me about it. She used to visit that place. She said there was a trail called Trail of the Hanged Whores. She told me that was where people would, back in the day, drag women, strip them, and hang them for being witches before burning them as an offering to the hangman. I looked at her, confused. Her face was frozen in an expression of anxiety. I could tell she wasn't bullshitting here, or not intentionally. Hangman? I asked. Who's that? I don't remember his name. Draco, maybe, something Draco. But yeah, he was like this batshit insane guy who was all religious and stuff and was a local witch hunter for the area back in the day. 
From what I was told, he would hide out in the woods deep in the mountains, waiting to attack witches whenever they'd gather there. Draco, I wondered. I'd never heard of that name before from any lectures in my history classes about the witch trials. I figured he must have been a small-timer, not all that notable like Matthew Hopkins or someone like that. Either that or people must have tried to keep his name hidden from the history books, maybe out of fear or shame, or possibly both. How many did he... Don't know exactly. At least a couple hundred for sure. But at some point he died. Still though, women were being hanged there for witchcraft. My grandmother told me it still happens even today. Even though, you know, we don't hunt witches anymore. Who's doing it? I asked, admittedly shocked. That's just it. Nobody knows. Grandma told me it's the ghost of the hangman, possessing people or something, telling them to hunt and kill people they think are witches. Others say it's some sort of cult or something. Either way, I'm just really not a fan. I was stumped. I wasn't sure what to say. Like I said, I wanted to have all my friends with me for this trip, but how could I argue with her here? Sure, I wasn't completely buying the whole ghost of witchfinder cadet haunting the trails of Grenview Pines thing. Later on, I did look up a bit of history on the place. She was at least telling the truth about the site being the place where executions took place during the witch trials. She was also right about many disappearances of women after supposedly hiking that trail, with no mention of any hangman or anything like that. I even tried looking up the name Draco, but nothing. Even still, I guess I could see why she was uncomfortable with the place. It did seem fucked up to drag her to a place where people like her were killed for having a different religion. That Saturday, we all gathered at my house. I told her it was up to her if she wanted to come along or not. It was another two days before I got a text from her saying she was willing to give it a shot. Well, look who decided to show up after all, Todd sneered. Cut it out, man, I retorted. We haven't even left the house yet. Fine, just saying though, you might want to watch out for little Miss Blair Witch here. Who knows what'll happen to people like... I said that's enough! He rolled his eyes and sighed before throwing his stuff into the van. Once we all packed into the van, making sure Todd and Shauna were as far apart as possible, it was Grenview Pines or bust. Fortunately, the drive was more or less smooth sailing from that point. Things seemed all good and well, aside from maybe Shauna's constant look of worry she had chiseled on her face the closer we came to the mountain pass. I noticed that even this seemed to pass a bit once we entered Grenview Pines. Now, I'm not exaggerating when I say that mine and Mara's breaths were literally taken right out of us seeing the mountain. Kendrick and Todd kept gawking in every direction as we went along, constantly shouting, Bro, check this out! Or, Dude, you gotta see this! Amanda couldn't stop squealing like a little girl who found out she got a pony for her birthday constantly trying to snap pictures of the mountain pass. Let me put it to you this way. We were driving through a professional painting that had only just been painted and was still wet. I mean that the colors, the detail, and just the overall atmosphere seemed fresh and new, like it had only been there for a couple of hours, like wet paint on a canvas. The place was alive. Words like beautiful, vibrant, and even picturesque were gross understatements when it came to describing the scenery. Even Shauna seemed to lighten up a bit, smiling out of her window as we drove along. Eventually, Kendrick asked if we could drop anchor so he could take a piss. Ironically enough, we weren't far from the Destin Trail, about half a mile out, and my legs were starting to get tired anyway from driving over four and a half hours straight, so I figured, what the hell, and stopped. It was here, though, at the entrance to the trail, that Shauna started looking nervous again. However, when I asked her about it, she shook her head and said, It's fine, just thought I... She trailed off, looking deep into the trail. What? 
I asked. Her eyes snapped back to me, seemingly confused. You were saying something. You said that you thought you were something? What's up? She looked back at the trail, eyebrows furrowed in concentration. I don't know, she said. I feel like I... like I sense something. What do you mean? I don't know. I feel something like spiritual energy coming from there. What kind of energy? Admittedly, I wasn't sure what to think here. While I wasn't into magic or witchcraft, I wasn't spiritual like Todd. In other words, I'd never really had much to do with anything supernatural related. Stuff like ghosts, demons, or spirits, or mystical energy. I wasn't one to sweep that kind of thing under the rug, either. An open-minded skeptic, essentially. She rubbed her temples, wincing. I don't know, she groaned. Look, you think we can find a different trail? I sighed and looked to the others who'd already started walking in. I could tell Shauna wasn't comfortable with this, but at the same time, what was I going to tell the others? I still didn't understand myself, outside of her objections and a bad feeling. If nothing else, I didn't feel like hearing Todd take jabs at Shauna again. Tell you what, I said finally. We'll do this. We'll hike here for a while. If something starts happening, we'll head back out here immediately. That sound cool? She glanced back and forth between me and the trail, still looking anxious, before sighing and saying, Fine. To help her relax, I promised I'd be right by her side the entire time. She seemed to accept this, and we ran to try and catch up with the others. The trail itself was just as colorful and detailed as the rest of the mountain. You wouldn't have known it by looking at Shauna's face constantly darting in every direction like she'd seen something or someone watching us. It took about 20 minutes before we finally found them again, midway in. They were standing around what looked like some sort of scarecrow or something. It was about 7 feet tall and made out of what looked like a person's skeleton tied to a wooden cross. A large black hood hung over the head and a rope around its neck knotted into a noose that hung like a necklace. Yo, Pat, check this out! Kendrick exclaimed. Cool, huh? What is it? I asked, glancing into the eyes of the thing. It's kinda creepy, Amanda chimed in. I had to agree, and I could see Morrow wasn't keen on the thing either. However, none of us could compare to Shauna whose face was even whiter than usual looking at the thing. Shauna, Mara called out. What's wrong? Shauna was frozen. Shauna? Very faintly, her mouth opened, and I heard her whisper, Hangman. Huh? Hangman, she repeated. That's him, just like I told you. I looked back at the scarecrow. That's right, Todd sneered with a shit-eating grin. That's the guy that used to hang people like you. I glared at him, hoping he'd pick up that this wasn't the time for him to be an asshole. He didn't, and went on to say, You think we'll find one of your ancestors here, <laughs> hanging around? Laughing. Shauna didn't seem to notice him, though. She didn't seem to notice any of us. She just stood, staring white-faced and jaw-slacked into the scarecrow's face. Shauna, I called out. Nothing. Just standing there, rooted where she stood. I called out her name again, this time shouting. Shauna! For a second she was still before turning around and booking it in the other direction where we came. Shauna! I shouted. Shauna, where are you going? Come back! She was long gone. Let her go, dude, Todd said. Let her go connect with nature or some shit. 
I turned to him, feeling my blood start to boil. What the hell is wrong with you? I barked. Look, just because she's a witch doesn't mean you get to be an asshole. Aw, oh, how cute. Sticking up for old good witch Glenda there. Look, man, I'm just trying to have some fun here. Not my fault she decides to play with magic and shit. Enough, Todd, Amanda scolded. His eyes went wide hearing this, and he snapped to look at her. Patrick's right. She's a person too. You don't have the right to be mean to her over beliefs, especially since she hasn't done a single thing to you. Todd stared, shocked. You too, babe? She stood, glaring at him. Wow, he exclaimed, sounding like he'd been betrayed. Great. Okay, you know what? Fine, fuck it, let's go find your little nature girl since y'all like her so much. I was half a second away from force-feeding him a knuckle sandwich with the side of my boot in his ass when I felt Mara tugging at my arm. Come on, we gotta find her before it gets too dark. Looking up, I saw that the sun was indeed going down. The light was just barely bleeding through the trees now. I knew we maybe only had an hour and a half if we were lucky to find Shauna before it got too dark to see anything, and because I'd planned on us stopping mid-trail and building a fire for camping for the night, neither my dumbass nor anybody else bothered to bring a flashlight. We all walked together in the direction we came from, all calling out into the trees around us, Shauna! There was no sound, either from her or anything else. I don't exactly remember hearing sounds other than the five of us. We'd walked for at least an hour, even though I knew we hadn't even been an hour's walk from where we'd started, and there was no sign of Shauna. Where is she? I was starting to get worried. A flurry of thoughts about Shauna being attacked by some wild animal out here in the woods, despite strangely not seeing or hearing any sign of wildlife anywhere or getting hurt and unable to move or get help. God, Shauna, why'd you have to run off? I started thinking about the Scarecrow again, wondering what got her this spooked about it. What did she mean by Hangman? I thought back to what she'd told me of the Hangman and his supposed ghost and of the weird energy from earlier. Again, not exactly one to believe that sort of thing, but then I remembered what she said about some crazy cult or something devoted to this guy, to the hangman, snatching women and killing them here in the woods in his name or whatever. That put a new thought into my head, making my heart drop into my stomach. What if there could be some maniacs in the woods with us? Had they already gotten Shauna? This caused me to quicken my stride, shouting louder for Shauna. Unfortunately, this did me no good either, and we were finally forced to stop when the sun finally sank far down below the trees. We set up a small fire and laid out our sleeping bags, deciding not to bother with the tents since we'd need to be up first thing the next morning to continue looking for Shauna. We just sat around the fire for a while, no one seeming to have anything to say. No one even seemed to have any appetite either declining my offer to break out the bratwursts I'd brought for us. Everyone just sat, either staring grimly at the fire or looking nervously at the trees surrounding us. Everyone, that is, of course, except for Todd, who looked more annoyed than concerned. This irritated me, but I said nothing. I stared at the fire, listening to it crackle and pop, the only sound in the area, silently praying that Shauna was okay. Amanda broke the silence. I hope she's okay. I'm sure she is, Kendrick replied. I wonder what riled her up. Amanda glared at Todd. What? he exclaimed. What did I do? You're kidding, right? Mara snapped. You don't think that spouting, the hangman's gonna get you, didn't have anything to do with this? How was I supposed to know she'd be such a pussy about it? What is your problem, huh? 
Where do you get off being a jerk to someone different? You mean besides the fact that she worships the devil? And you're so much better, I chimed, venom seeping into my voice. I don't know what y'all's deal is. If she was so scared of this shit, she shouldn't have come. I'm not going to feel bad for it either. I said what I said. That tore it for me. Oh yeah? I shouted. Well, how about this? Next time, we just leave you out, huh? Then we won't have to deal with an arrogant fuckface like you. He scoffed, rolling his eyes and stood up, grabbing his sleeping bag. Okay, fine. If you guys don't want me around, I'll go. Me and Mandy will sleep over... Oh, hell no, Amanda blurted. You're on your own. We're through. Wait, what? You're not serious. What the fuck, babe? Come on. No, I mean it. I'm not going to be with someone who will be bigoted like that. It's childish, stupid, and I'm not having anything to do with it or you. Todd just stood there for a second, once again dumbfounded. Finally, he sighed and said, Okay, I'm sorry. Please don't... Bye, Todd, she snapped, cutting him off for a second time. Again, he stood for a moment before I saw his face twist into the most deranged glare I'd ever seen from him, and declaring that we'd regret this before storming off into the woods with his stuff. After that, it was silent again. It was late by that point, almost a quarter to midnight, and my eyes became increasingly hard to keep open. Amanda was the first to nod off, followed almost immediately by Kendrick. Mara lasted a little longer, but eventually she was fast asleep. I was the last one to go. I don't know how long I was out, but I remember being briefly awakened to the sound of rustling coming from the woods. Now, real quick, keep in mind, I'm not a light sleeper. I'm usually pretty well conditioned when it comes to sleeping through just about any kind of noise. I grew up in the city, usually being as busy at nighttime as it was during the day. Plus, the dorm I live in is one of those where somebody in my hall was throwing a party almost every other night. Loud ones, too, suffice to say. I guess, though, because of how worried I was about Shauna and the fact that there hadn't been any sounds around us for so long until just then, I must have noticed out of alarm. Looking around, I saw nothing, and there were no sounds again. Uh, hello? I called out, groggily. Who's there? Nothing. No sounds, no rustling, nothing. Whatever, I thought as I laid back down. I was out again almost instantly. Kendrick shook me when I awakened again, whispering to me, Dude, wake up. Huh? I snapped, almost bolting straight up. Kendrick? Dude, what are you... There's someone in the woods. I cocked my eyebrows at him. What are you talking about? Someone is walking around the woods. I think he's watching us or something. I got up to take a leak when I saw him looking at me behind another tree. It's probably Todd, also having to take a piss or something. That's not it, dude. There were a couple of them scrambling around in the trees. There was something else I saw, too. What? I asked, now noticeably more alarmed. People watching us? But where? Why? It's... it's... He stammered. I noticed then that his entire body was shaking. Oh god, dude, it was a body. It was a dead body hanging from one of the trees. I bolted upright. Where? He pointed off to our left into the woods. Out there. Dude, we gotta get out of here. Who was it? I asked, already getting a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. What? Hanging from the tree. Did you see who it was? I don't know, man. Some chick or something. Bro, what does it even matter? We have to get the hell out of here. Take me to it, 
I demanded. His face went albino white. Are you fucking nuts, dude? Did you not hear a single word I just fucking said? Someone is watching. Yeah, I heard you, and we have someone missing out there. You forget about that? His face somehow managed to sink further into a state of shock. And you said you saw a body? Yeah, he replied weakly. Don't you think we need to see whether or not it's Shauna? He slumped down, still shaking like he had an alarm clock stuffed down his throat. I quickly scrambled out of my sleeping bag. Come on, let's go get the others. I started shaking Mara awake while he went for Amanda. Sweetheart, hey babe, come on, you gotta wake. Pat, Amanda's gone! What? My head snapped to look at him. He was holding Amanda's sleeping bag with no Amanda. She's gone, dude! He exclaimed. This caused Mara to stir awake. Huh, Patrick? What's going... Come on, babe, we gotta go. I helped her out of her sleeping bag before running over to Kendrick. Where did you see it? See what? Mara asked, joining us. Kendrick filled her in on the details while I glanced at Amanda's sleeping bag. On it appeared to be some symbol painted in what I was hoping to God wasn't blood. It looked like a cross with a large hoop dangling from its bottom. Guys, look at this. I pointed to the symbol and they both looked confused. What is that? Mara asked me. I don't know. It looks like one of those symbols Shauna would show us when she'd tell our fortune or something. What did she call them? Runes? I felt a chill run through me. She was right. It did look like something Shauna would have drawn. Then I started thinking about the body Kendrick was panicking over. What if it isn't Shauna's? Kendrick, where's the body? I urged. He was frozen in shock. I shouted his name again, this time breaking him from his stupor. Where's the body? There. Here, he said, shaking. Follow me. He led us about a mile away from our camp when he stopped us. There, in the moonlight, was the silhouette of a woman hanging from one of the distant trees. I saw it. I ran up to it and I screamed, Guys, come quick! It was Amanda. She was stripped completely naked, with her mouth duct taped and her wrists tied behind her back. I retched and had to cover my mouth. Mara and Kendrick came running over. What's going? She cut off abruptly to scream. Kendrick exclaimed, Dear God! Before also retching. Dude, we gotta get out of here. What about her? Mara cried. We can't just leave her here. Better her than us. What about Shauna? Shauna? Kendrick exclaimed. That's why you're worried? Look at Amanda. And didn't you say that it was one of her little witch symbols on her sleeping bag? I hate to say it, but I'm starting to think Todd might have been right. Either way, that's going to be us if we don't get the fuck out of- Guys, shut up. I snapped, cutting him off. You hear that? It was faint, but I could hear something rustling in the trees around us. It was quick, whatever it was, and it sounded like it was darting back and forth from one tree to the next. What? What is that? Mara asked nervously. It's coming from over there. I could hear it again, seeming to close in from all around us. Yeah, I hear it too, Kendrick said, shaking. Come on, we gotta get out of here. What about Amanda? Mara asked. We can't just leave her here. And what about Shauna? She's still... What about us? Look, let's get out of here. We can get help or something. Just please, can we go? All right, here's what we're gonna do, I said, tossing Kendrick the keys to the minivan. The sounds were getting closer. 
Mara, you and Kendrick head back to the van. As soon as you get down the mountain, find the police and have them send somebody out here. What about you? I'm going to see if I can find Shauna. Her eyes bugged out. Look, I'll be fine. Just go. I could tell she was about to try and protest, but Kendrick took her by the hand and began leading her back towards the entrance of the trail. The rustling was so close now that it felt right on top of me. Shauna? I called out into the trees. Shauna, is that you? Nothing. Just rustling, zipping from tree to tree all around me. That was when a shiver dropped down my spine, realizing it wasn't just one thing or a person in the woods. I was surrounded, and I couldn't move. I noticed, though, that right as they'd be right on me, where I'd be able to see them, they stopped and began zipping around me instead of towards me. They're circling me. Who's there? I finally managed to shout. There was no response, and the sound stopped. Who are you? What do you want? Silence. Having finally worked up enough courage to move, I slowly stepped forward. Who are you? What do you want with my friends and me? I took another step forward, slowly advancing to another of the trees behind the one Amanda was hanging from. Why did you... I was cut off when I saw something shoot out from behind the tree and snag my throat, instantly tightening and suffocating me. I clawed frantically at it, but it was no use. The knot tightened around my throat as I felt myself being pulled towards the tree by it. I stumbled and fell, causing me to be dragged on my stomach to the tree. My vision started clouding with every second the knot was around my throat, forcing the air right out of me. I saw a figure step out from behind the tree, holding the other end of the rope, pulling it taut. The figure looked like a man, buck-ass nude and muscular, with a black executioner's hood over his face and a noose around his neck, dangling like a necklace. It was the hangman. He was real. This made my eyes get even bigger, not just from strangulation but also from pure terror. I would have screamed had the noose not been choking me. I thought I'd died right then and there. As it was, I let out strained wheezing before my vision went completely black. This was quickly thrown out the window when I awoke to what felt like a hot piece of metal being pressed into my side. Directly in front of me was a giant, bright orange light, and I felt an immense heat blasting my face. I groaned in pain as my vision strained back to normal. I saw that I was naked with my wrists tied and hoisted above my head. Above my left hip was a pentagram in the shape of a goat branded into my skin. I looked up to see more of them gathered around me, all nude with hoods over their faces and wearing noose necklaces. Who are you? I cried out, weakly. They all just stood there, silently glaring at me through their hoods for a moment. Finally, one of them shouted, In the name of the hangman, Edmund Draco, God's destroyer of the wicked and instrument of righteousness, we continue his good work by cleansing the earth of vile creatures like you. What? What are you talking about? Who is Edmund Draco? My mind went back to what Shauna told me about the hangman legend how he was once a witch hunter named Draco. Was this the same guy? Then I remembered what she said about a crazy cult that lurked through these woods, snatching people they saw as witches and killing them. What do you want with me? I didn't do anything. I'm not even a witch. I, said another voice, sounding like a young woman. But ye consort with a witch... Ye be in league with one of Lucifer's whores. What are you even talking about? I'm an atheist! 
I don't believe in any of that shit. I heard a shocked gasp pass through the crowd. Look, this is fucking insane. Let me go. You hear that? Called another younger voice. This one sounded familiar. Too familiar. He denounces God. He, of his own will, has testified to rejecting Christ. He's in league with a witch, and thus his soul is just as tainted. He must be cleansed. My eyes almost shot from my head. No, that isn't... Todd? He pulled off his hood, revealing his smirking face, still looking as devious as ever. My heart stopped abruptly. What are you... Doing the Lord's work. We are ridding the land of the wickedness of witchcraft, just as he, the great hangman, did long ago. He then gestured to the bonfire in front of me. The skeletal scarecrow from before was looming down from behind the blaze. We continue his good work. You're insane! I screamed at him. You all are! You murdered Amanda, your girlfriend! His face instantly dropped his triumphant smirk and became cold, bitter. Ex-girlfriend, remember? She chose, like you, to side with the devil. He's to blame, with his harlot familiar. She is responsible for her death. I started struggling to no use. The rope tied around my wrists was tight, and I began losing feeling in them. You do know there are people who'll come looking for me, right? They'll see what you've done, find all of you, and lock you up for life. His demented grin almost immediately returned, full blast. Oh, really? And who would that be? He then pointed towards the crowd to two of them, dragging long ropes behind them. My blood was chilled once again when, coming towards the bonfire light, I saw that they were dragging Mara and Kendrick's frightened and struggling bodies. You mean them? He chided. Others who've sided against God? You looked to them for aid? He chuckled deviously before saying, That is why you have no hope. You have turned from the Lord and embraced sinfulness. Thus, the lot of you must face the judgment of the hangman. The two men then dragged Kendrick, wheezing intensely and clawing at the rope, in front of the fire. I started feebly struggling again. Don't you fucking touch him, you freak! He paid no attention. I watched as the two figures forced him up to his feet in front of Todd, his body hanging limply in their arms. Kendrick Ulrich, Todd declared his voice gradually deepening. You stand accused of consorting with a witch and being in league with servants of evil. How do you plead? To this, the crowd chanted, Guilty! in unison. Kendrick himself said nothing, only coughing and gasping for air like a hooked fish. Guilty, Todd declared. You have been found guilty in the eyes of the hangman for consorting with the devil. You attempt to play with fire, sell your soul to fire, and therefore... He pointed to the bonfire. It is by fire you must be cleansed. The two men began dragging Kendrick to the bonfire and tying the other end to a tree branch that hung above it. Kendrick tried squirming again, but the men were strong clutching him with an iron vice grip. After tying his hands behind his back, they hoisted his body by the throat and dropped him to dangle over the flames. I could only watch, breathless and petrified, as my friend was slowly barbecued over the bonfire, dangling by his neck. The flames engulfed him in less than seconds, I still hear the screams he made as he burned alive, if you could even call it that. 
It didn't sound natural or even human at all, as if you mixed the whistling sound a tea kettle makes with the yowling of a cat. That's what it sounded like. Through it all, Todd just watched with a grin on his face. I felt my own body go limp with terror as Kendrick's screams died with the rest of him. You're a freak, Todd! I cried out in rage. You're an animal! Instead, he didn't acknowledge me, instructing the two men dragging Mara along to bring her to the fire, like Kendrick. This sent my heart racing again. No, Mara, let her go! Mara Edwards, you stand accused of consorting with a witch and being in league with servants of evil. How do you plead? Like with Kendrick, the crowd roared again. Guilty! I tried to yank my arms down from over my head with all my strength. Still, my hands weren't going anywhere. Mara looked up at him, hatred in her eyes and spat in his face. Go to hell! His face enraged again. Todd delivered a swift swipe across her left cheek. You spit in my face? He roared. Hell is where I will personally send you, back to where you belong, slut. He jerked her by the rope around her neck to the fire and tied her hands behind her back. Mara! I cried. Mara! She looked up at me as Todd tied the other end around the branch, readying to drop her into the fire. Her eyes were wide and sad, and I saw her open her mouth, faintly hearing her whisper, I love you, Patrick, before she was dropped over the flames. I screamed and howled until my vocal cords ripped open as Mara burned. It took even longer for her to die than Kendrick, forcing me to listen and watch even longer as she suffered. Eventually, it was silent again. I hung limply in my restraints again. I had nothing left. No strength, no motivation, no will to try and fight anymore. This was it. I was next. And there wasn't a damn thing I could do about it. I felt jerked forward toward the fire by the rope around my neck. Todd began his speech again. Patrick Reed, you stand accused of... Freeze! called a voice from the trees to my right. Todd and the crowd all snapped their heads in the direction of the voice. I looked over and immediately went slack-jawed. It was the police. But how? Todd looked just as baffled as me. The crowd slowly began backing away from that area of the woods. All of you, on the ground, hands behind your heads, the officer ordered, pistol trained at Todd. More officers began emerging from the woods, guns drawn and aimed at the crowd. No one made a move. They stood silently as the officers moved in closer. They're the devil's servants, Todd shouted. They too have sided with the evil one. He then pointed at the officer and declared, Seize them for judgment. The crowd went berserk again and leapt for the officers. Instantly, the sounds of gunshots filled the air, and at least ten of them, including Todd himself, dropped dead. Seeing this, the remainder of them fled into the trees left of me, disappearing almost immediately. The officers then covered the area, with a few heading further in after the others who got away. I was speechless, baffled, and awed. I was locked in a state of shock. I was alive. I was just seconds away from being burned alive like my friends, but I was alive. I'd been saved. But the question then came back to me. How? Where had they come from? Who called them? And how did they find me deep in the woods? 
While one of the officers was cutting me free, I asked him. We got an anonymous call from someone who said they were a friend of yours, he replied. They'd seen your little pal here dragging and hanging a girl's body to a tree a little ways back. When we found the body, we could follow the racket going on, leading here. Anonymous call? It didn't take long before it hit me. Shauna. She was still alive. They led me out of the trail and back to my van. Sure enough, there was Shauna, waiting by the van with two other officers. She ran up and quickly snatched me into a bear hug. Are you okay? I'm sorry I ran off like that, but I didn't feel right. And when I saw what Todd did... She stopped and looked around. Where are the others? I gave her a grim expression, being two seconds from bursting into tears, and turned my head to the trail entrance. I didn't need to say anything. She understood enough to start tearing up immediately. What I did manage to choke out was, Thank you. Of course. You're my friend, and you always stood up for me. I just wished I could have been quicker with it. Maybe then... She trailed off, looking towards the trail again. After that, Shauna hugged me tightly before being escorted away by a police officer as an ambulance showed up and checked me out. Once that was all over with, I was finally allowed to go home, a couple of police cars following as escorts back to my house. To say I didn't sleep well that night is a grave understatement, and it's not gotten any better. I feel afraid to be around people now, after what happened. I haven't felt comfortable leaving my house, save for the quick grocery run I made two days ago. I still kept occasional contact with Shauna. It was about a week after this all happened that she texted me pictures of her grandmother's old journal. Apparently, she kept it for documenting her trips. In them, she has a detailed history of Grenview Pines, which, of course, would include, among a bunch of other far more bizarre ghost stories, the Trail of the Hanged Whores. She convinced me to write this, both for comfort and a warning. I spent hours reading, more or less, the same thing she told me about before. Back in the witch trials, Edmund Draco was a proclaimed expert witch hunter, whose M.O. was the cleansing of the earth from the plague of witchcraft, to quote the text. He was known to perform public executions in those woods, where he would drag the devil's whores, as he constantly referred to them, and hang them over a blazing fire. The text further explains that he had managed to amass his little group of witch hunters who basically all but worshipped the guy and followed his every command. Eventually, it's said that Draco finally managed to meet his match when he executed the head of a particular coven. I think they were called the Violet Sisterhood, maybe. I can't remember. The others managed to exact revenge by killing him one night in his sleep. It was said that the hangman's spirit became tethered to the land, forever linked to that trail where he executed witches, forever bound to continuing his task and leading his ever-expanding cult in delivering the earth from wickedness. Well, that's what the journal said anyway. And clearly, Shauna and her grandmother weren't the only ones who believed the legend. I still don't believe in the hangman's ghost or any shit like that, but I do believe one thing. The second strongest fear, next to the unknown, is the power of belief. Belief, like what drove Shauna to run away that day, or how people like Todd devoted themselves to this supposed mission of righteousness. The power of belief is a power that should never be underestimated. I also believe that a book should never be judged by its cover. Corny, I know, but I can't lie and say that it doesn't apply here. I'd known Todd, or thought I did, since high school. I never once thought that he'd do the things he did in all that time. 
and with Grandview Pines itself, an absolutely beautiful place, I wouldn't have thought that such horrible things happened and still happen there. At the same time, where he and Kendrick were quick to assume the worst from Shauna because she was Wiccan, she was the one who saved my life. The last thing I'll say is this. I believe in one other thing. They're still out there, in the woods of Grenview Pines, still seeking to rid the land of the wickedness of witchcraft, just as he, the great hangman, did long ago. I worked at a dog show once when I was 17. No, unlike Westminster, where they make the dogs prance around on an endless victory lap and balance plates on their noses, and none of that tuxedo crap. These were hunting dogs. It's a timed run, how fast they can retrieve game and such, only while the owners and judges are sitting up on a big hill with their stopwatches and probably a few flasks of whiskey, do they need some dope to sweat their balls off playing the role of the hunter? That's where I came in. You see, they set you up in this wide open field with a shotgun and a burlap sack filled to the gills with dead chickens. When the bougie types up on the hill give the signal, you fire the shotgun in the air and chuck the dead bird high so the dog can see it fall. Then all you gotta do is get the hell out of the way while the dog does its thing, and about five to ten minutes later, you do it all over again. It wasn't all that bad, aside from the sunburn, all the flies, and the never-ending funk of dead livestock that you can still smell in your sleep. At lunch, they give you a brown bag containing a peanut butter sandwich, some chips, and a can of warm coke. But it was $300 for a couple of days of work, and since it was my gym teacher, Mr. Lyons, who was running the show on his own ranch, all the money was under the table. That was some decent cash back in high school. Tell me I can fire a shotgun and you've got me sold, never mind the fact they were only blanks. The first day wasn't too rough. Getting to lunch was the worst part. After that, sundown seemed to creep up just around the corner. I figured I could ease off the gas some and get a little cocky the next day. I was there at the crack of dawn, barely able to stand, let alone hold a shotgun properly, when Lyons heaved another one of the burlap sacks at my feet like I'm supposed to be pleased as punch. Christ, that smell was awful. He spent a good minute eyeing me up. Looking a bit peaked there, he said with a raised brow. Been drinking? I kind of wiped my forehead and shuffled my feet, trying to make it less obvious that I was nursing a two-ton hangover. Then I shrugged and told him I hadn't been eating much and that maybe I was starting to feel it. I bet, he said. Hopefully you can find a way to work that scatter gun without blowing your goddamn face off. I thought they were only blanks. They are. But blanks or not, you suddenly find yourself on the wrong side of that barrel, and you'll wind up with a hell of a lot more than a skin rash, boy. I laughed and said, <laughs> I'm more worried about what's in that sack. None of them held up for more than an hour yesterday before they started falling apart like cotton candy. The tricky part about working with dead things, you see, is that nature is always working against you. Rigor mortis sets in faster than you'd think. And when your whole job is to throw said dead thing into the air, a little stiffness can make matters interesting. The first piece that breaks off is usually the wings, so then you gotta grab them by the head. When that eventually pops off like a champagne cork, you're stuck lobbing what are basically feathered footballs. Well, Lyons just smirked and gave his word they'd hold up. How do you know? I asked. Next got rung less than 15 minutes ago, he answered. They're as fresh as daisies. Now, keep in mind this sack must have weighed close to 50 pounds. Let's say the average chicken only weighs a couple of pounds. That's about 25 of them all bunched up in there. 
That's a lot of neck wringing. And only 15 minutes earlier, according to Lyons, who looked like he'd hardly broken a sweat. I hauled all my gear into the truck and Lyons drove me out to the drop-off point. Setting up for the first round gets to be a little exercise in patience while the bougie types are busy collecting themselves a quarter mile out, all laughing and setting up their parasols and whatnot. Meanwhile, it's hardly even seven o'clock and you've got more grime on you than they've seen in a year. But once we get started, it doesn't take long to fall into the rhythm of things. The radio crackles, you fire a shot, toss the bird like some gizzard-packed satchel, duck, wait, and then reset. Rinse and repeat. And you know what? Lyons was right. That stock was as fresh as daisies. The only problem was that a good number of them were already missing their heads, and every time I pulled one out, I couldn't help noticing the lack of blood all around. It wasn't a detriment, really, just something that gave me pause. I didn't mention anything when Lyons drove up with the restock. He'd come over every couple of hours, usually with the same recycled batch, but once they'd inevitably fall apart after a certain period of time, you knew there was always a fresh bag ready to go. When I radioed that I was completely out of stock, there was only a short delay before I saw his truck tearing down the hill toward me. Right off the bat, something appeared off as he tossed me the sack, shutting his eyes and grimacing. That's when I saw that his left hand was all bandaged up. He didn't acknowledge it, and if I learned anything growing up with a hard-nosed mother, it's that sometimes it was better to keep your trap shut, and that gauze only got redder and redder each time he came down. It was hot out. So hot it made you forget about all the miserable knuckle-stripping winters when you were praying for warm weather. So hot that a glass of tap water might as well have been a chalice of aged wine served atop a silver platter. Then there was that smell. Maybe the long hours were already starting to catch up to me, but I almost ran through a whole pack of smokes before lunch, which still didn't help. And unlike the day before, sundown was like watching paint dry. My arms and neck were all burnt to hell, and my face felt like beef jerky. It got to be that I didn't even feel like washing up. I just wanted to be as far from there as possible. I was putting away the shotgun when I heard a bang coming from one of the chicken coops. It sounded like a sack of potatoes. I checked it out, but couldn't see anything there. My ears told me otherwise, as I could hear the chickens in there bouncing all over the damn place, flapping around nervously and making these shrill noises. It sounded like maybe there was something in there with them. My eyes darted to see if I could get a better angle, maybe let the moon shine a bit. Just blackness. Nothingness. And when I saw a larger crack in the paneling near my knees... I crouched down and peered through that one, too. The funny thing was, I found something staring back at me. I jumped back. A big whiff of dirt and dust blew out of the crack in one short breath. Heavy, forceful stomps followed, then dragged toward the other side of the coop, through the small wired area, and finally out into the tall grass-lined property only to disappear by the time I made my way around. The hell you doing? A voice behind me bellowed. Lions. A cigarette cherry blazed over his face. I told him I thought I'd seen something, and he just laughed when he noticed the shotgun still clutched in my hands. <laughs> well, a hell of a lot you were going to do with that, he said. The smile left his face slowly as though something had suddenly dawned on him. He patted his smoke out on the bottom of his boot and asked me exactly what I thought I'd seen. I don't know, I told him. A person, I guess. I just heard a noise and checked it out. And? He moved closer. In the glow of a nearby bug zapper, I saw that his bandage badly needed changing. And nothing, I answered. Whatever it was took off down that way. 
sounded like it might have dragged something off. Lyon scanned the tall grass. Then he grabbed the shotgun from me and said, Your money's on the kitchen counter. Lock up before you leave, will you? He looked out again over that tall grass and seemed to pretend that I was already gone. I locked up, just as he said. All the sports cars and brand new pickups that had lined the extended driveway just a few hours earlier were gone now, so I guess he didn't care if my filthy self left out the front. Besides, his mind had seemed to have been elsewhere. I didn't really give a damn. I was just glad to have my money and be done with it. The breeze felt pretty good as I cruised down that first stretch of back road. But then, out of the window, I could hear a cry that reminded me of a howling dog. And though lions certainly had a few of them, there was something unmistakably human about it, the way it bounced off the trees like the baleful moans of an opera singer. You know distress when you hear it. Sometimes it doesn't take words. I wouldn't have had a clue if I had heard it yesterday. But now, my imagination was running wild, and I knew who it belonged to. Something that stomped around like a silverback gorilla and sucked the blood out of headless chickens. Something that could make Lion's hand leak like a broken faucet and get him all tensed up at the mere thought of being loose on his ranch. Something he thought was worth hiding, not just from me, but from all of his bougie dog show friends also. That cry I'd heard belonged to whatever was in that dark chicken coop, and I knew I would never know unless I pulled along the side of the road and doubled back. I was dumb enough to come back the second day. (laughs) Why should I play it smart now, then? I killed my lights as I neared. The moans had quieted, but were still lively enough to lead me back toward the coop, and I could hear lions. Goddamn animal, he said. He was standing inside the wiring, looking in through the coop's open door. If your mother, God rest her soul, could only see you now, he shook his head. You're gonna spend a night in there, and come morning, if I find you've gotten into any of them, I swear you'll be praying for the ass beating I gave you earlier, let me tell you. I hid behind a tree until he was gone then tiptoed over to the wiring. He'd padlocked the door. I could hear breathing, quick, labored, and raspy in a way that made my throat itch. Hello? I called. The breathing relaxed. I'm not going to, you know, I want to talk, that's all. I moved to one of the cracks in the wood, listening to my pulse but saw only the darkness. Though the breathing made me nervous, I decided that I had to do something. I got a bolt cutter from the tool shed and snapped off the padlock. The door creaked open. It's okay, I whispered. You can come out. I'm not going to hurt you. The breathing suddenly intensified like a churning engine, growing raspier and raspier almost excitedly so. I just bought that lock yesterday, said Lyons. He was standing outside the wiring, a shotgun aimed square at my chest. It ain't right, locking somebody up like an animal. An animal, he said, sneering. That sounds about right. Don't give me that look. You're just a dumb kid sticking his nose where it doesn't belong. The hell do you know about raising a child, huh? He stopped suddenly and smiled. Looks like we have company. He didn't have to say anything. I knew those thumping footsteps, the odd dragging, the raspy breath that was now so close I could taste it, and in the stark moonlight, I saw it. Or rather, I saw her. She crawled on her belly using a pair of hulking arms, stamping the ground with these wide, meaty hands. Her burlap dress was in tatters, dragging behind her along with a pair of jutting, dead-as-doornail legs. 
she squealed and stamped toward me. Lyons blocked my way. Oh, no you don't, he said, raising the shotgun. Looks to me like she's a little sweet on you, don't you think? Well, she was still crawling toward me, and there was only a flimsy chicken wire and plywood door between me and Lyons, but he realized what I had in mind and pinned my wrist to the door. The barrel flashed, searing, white-hot pain. I collapsed, holding my hand to my chest. It was blackened, sticky, and felt like it was on fire. Huh, would you look at that? He said. Hell of a skin rash you got there, boy. Maybe you'd better hold up for tonight. I could feel her on me. She stank, smelling of stale, dried sweat. I closed my eyes, only opening them as I felt something warm and wet. She was licking up the bloody mess like a cat over a milk bowl, even making a soft purring noise. She smiled at me in her own unique way, her hair lips spreading miles. Then, as Lyons leaned in, she suddenly began making these god-awful hissing sounds, and I could feel the full weight of her sliding over me. A horrible scream erupted from the other side of the wire. She was on him, crushing his neck with those massive hands, hands strong enough to wring the necks of 25 chickens like it was no harder than making a sandwich, hands strong enough to make Lion's eyes look more like cue balls sticking out of his head until they finally burst. She pushed herself up onto his chest and let out a victorious howl. There aren't any more shows now, and no more chickens. How could there be? Lizzie had free reign after that. Well, I had to call her something. And anyway, she looks like a Lizzie. You know, Elizabeth Bathory and all that. That's okay. She doesn't have much of a sense of humor either. Some people stopped by a while back, but didn't find anything. Lizzie made sure of that. It turns out, chickens weren't all she ate. She made sure to hide meat, too. I can't leave, you see. She won't let me. Funny how just talking nicely to someone can really put the hook on them. That's what Lyons couldn't wrap his head around, that his daughter was growing up. Her tastes change, as well as her needs. She even insisted on us sleeping in the same bed, and how was I going to argue? She's got one hell of a grip, and believe me, she knows where to hurt a man. I found that out the hard way when I tried to make a break for it one night. And sometimes she gets mad for no reason, even when I try to stay out of her way. Playing house takes a lot out of you. There isn't much left anymore. Just a hand so that I can jot this down on some scrap paper I found crumpled up inside the coop. Someday.
tales for dark nights.